Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. Uh, in this episode, I'm very happy to bring my conversation I had with Avram Alpert. Avram is a writer, teacher, and organizer, trying to understand the values that we have in this world. He is kind of a jack of all trades. As he mentions in the conversation, he's, he's done many things. Uh, currently, he's a fellow at the New Institute in Hamburg. Um, he's co-edited and co-managed uh, programming for Shifter Magazine. He co-founded the Interdisciplinary Art and Theory Program uh, at Jack Shaman Gallery. And he is the author of three books. Uh, most recently, the book, The Good Enough Life, which is the book that we, we talk about. And we, we really spend a lot of time uh, getting into um, a good dialogue about some of these things. Uh, as I mentioned in the conversation, um, it's a really good book. And I, I don't agree, I don't think, with everything in it. And that's what makes it so amazing because I don't have like strong disagreements. But it's one of those books that will make you think um, and get you to toy around with some of these ideas. And, and it, I remember walking away from reading the book um, thinking, yeah, I'm not sure about this, but you know what? I'm thinking way more about it. And I think the best books really do that. If, you, if you're thinking more um, about a topic or something in a different way you didn't, um, and you're, you're less married to your you know, previous ideas or, or maybe to the ideas in the book, that's, that's, a, that's a good book. That's an impactful book. Um, there are many things that I, I definitely agree with Avram on, uh, but even in the points of disagreement, uh, uh, it's, it's one of those things where I don't feel so strongly. I'm like, I'm not sure. I should probably think about this more. And so you see a lot of that in the conversation where we, we think about out loud kind of, and, and he's, he's such a good interlocutor for that. He's really, really excellent at, at a great conversation and, and one of the nicest people. And I, I had just such a nice, uh, conversation with him and, and, wish I could talk with him, you know, on a monthly basis. He's just such a good person to, to bounce ideas around. Um, so we start the conversation by talking about what is the good enough life? What does he mean by that? How does he define it? Um, we talk about how is it more than just basic needs? Uh, we talk about pluralism and, and relativism. We spend a good amount of time talking about greatness. Um, and just as a, a footnote here, this is a very small footnote. At the time when we recorded this, uh, this is before the current French Open. And in the in the conversation, I mentioned that Rafael Nadal has 13 French Opens um, <laughs> on greatness. Uh, Nadal has gone on to win his 14th French Open uh, a few weeks ago. And so <laughs> it's like I, I remember uh, thinking about this and saying, oh, my goodness, you know, it's just, we were talking about this whole greatness thing. And, you know, this guy keeps extending his, his record at the uh, French Open. We talk about elements of good enough for social policies and what this kind of looks like in the world. Um, again, I really enjoyed this bit of the conversation uh, to try and really make it somewhat tangible, um, which he's, he's very good at doing in the book and in the conversation. We talk about good enough in the realm of work, um, how work is perceived in the, the new generation. Uh, and then we end the conversation talking about virtue ethics and, and some of the particulars around that. Um, again, I had a, an absolutely fantastic time talking with, with Avram. He's, he's such a good uh, person to talk to and to think out loud with, with many, many important, tough issues. And, and uh, I hope everyone uh, picks up his book and, uh, and, and really supports what he's doing. And so now I bring you Avram Alpert. I am here with Avram Alpert. Avram, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm uh, greatly looking forward to, uh, to talking to you. Thank you so much for having me. A pleasure to be here. Yeah. So um, before we get into your book that you just wrote, uh, just tell listeners uh, who you are, what you do, what you what you study, what your day job is, and uh, and and all the all the good stuff. So I am a writer and educator by by training. I actually have a PhD in um, literary studies, but I do a lot kind of literature, philosophy, political science. Um, I have been teaching uh, writing at Princeton for the last few years, so I've just left to take a position at the new institute in Germany. So I'll be there nice. for the next few years, continuing my writing. Um, I also like doing public conversations. I used to organize a lot of public conversations in New York. Um, so just kind of thinking about, you know, what does the humanities have to offer society at large? Mm. 
Yeah, no, that's that's uh, that's wonderful. Uh, I didn't know about the the new gig, so congrats. That's uh, that's very nice. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I hope so. <laughs> so I started in a week, so oh, it's, it's good. right around. They the seem they seem, seems like a very very good place to be. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, you've written a really interesting and uh, very thoughtful book, um, which I'm I'm really excited to talk to you about. The book is called The Good Enough Life. And I think, I think this is one of the few books I've read that doesn't have a subtitle. All books have a subtitle. They have this really <laughs> long subtitle and it was like, oh, that's it. Just, you know, and it, maybe it's appropriate, but uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, a, <laughs> and, I, and I think you say in the book, it started out as like, in essays and then you add it one or is, is that how it started or how did you get to coming to, to writing the book? Uh, so I actually wrote this first. The, the, there was a night of philosophy now called the night of ideas that there is in cities uh, around the world. And there was one in at the Brooklyn public library and very randomly, they had a philosophical op-ed contest and a friend of mine emailed me and said, you know, do you want to go to the night of ideas? And I was just sort of looking through the listings and I saw this op-ed contest and I've been kind of complaining about the world for a long time and how it was very kind of unevenly structured and, and there wasn't a good space for people who were, you know, not perfect, but still decent. And, and what does the world look like for us? And um, I was calling it kind of, what about a good enough life? And so I sent it in for this op-ed contest and the, it was chosen by the, the editor, Peter Carapano, uh, to run, you know, to win the contest and, and to run in the New York Times. And then after I wrote uh, the essays, uh, uh, an editor at Pins and Press read it and said, hey, this seems really interesting. Would you like to develop it into a book? And I said, yeah. Like I, I was sort of thinking about that anyway, but that's, you know, it sort of started in short form um, and then we kind of talked about it and it developed from, you know, a short piece that was just laying out, you know, what does it mean to kind of think about what's good enough and um, what is decency and what is sufficiency and, and how can we try to make a world that everyone has that into this pretty, you know, not, not long, but, but I think a couple hundred pages detailing what that looks like individually, interpersonally, socially, and, and ecologically. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the trajectory of writing it. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's a very interesting book. I, I remember as I was reading it, I remember thinking like, you know, what, having a lot of kind of dialogue with myself about it and saying like, well, what do I think about mm -hmm. this? So it's one of those books mm -hmm. that it's, it stays with me where I'm, I'm, I'm like, and I'm not sure how I feel about this, but I like, this is really mm -hmm. good. I don't know about that. So mm -hmm. it's a, it's a good book because it gets you thinking, which is, which is, I think the best good. books always do that. So, um, sure. so, so, so maybe th there's, there's, there's kind of a, uh, two-sided thing here, I think, but, but, but I want to get to first is how do you define the good enough life? You know, what does that mm -hmm. uh, look like for you or how do you kind of operationalize that definition? Yeah, no, and I appreciate what, what you said. And I don't imagine this is a book that everyone is going to agree with every page about, right? But that, that it is offering something. And I try to kind of be conversational in the book and engage and say, you know, here's, here's how I see things and, and here's how I'm laying it out. And I'd love to keep talking about it. So this is a really nice opportunity yeah, yeah. to do that. You know, so that I can talk more if we'd like at some point about the kind of origins of the phrase and where it comes from. But what, what I really like about the idea of good enough is that it, it captures for me a couple of interrelated points. Mm. Right? One is that no matter how talented or excellent or wonderful we are, or even as a society we are, life has imperfections, right? There's there's unrequited love that we, we can't remove no matter how advanced technologically, socially we become. Um, there are accidents that are going to occur. Uh, there are um, tragedies that, that befall us all. And so, you know, we should look at the world as only ever good enough. But within that good enoughness, right, how do we respond to that good enough condition? And so one of the things I say in the book is that the, the kinks in our condition are best borne by our connections to our infinite kindred, which is a very alliterative way to say, right, we do well when everyone else does well, right? We can kind of bear these difficulties of existence when we are in a world that is thriving for and robust and meaningful for most people. And so the phrase good enough kind of takes these two parts of our condition, right, our, our kind of material selves and our spiritual selves, and gives us, in one word, 
right? Good and enough. So it's good in the sense that it's kind of meaningful and purposive and there's decency and there's care. And it's enough in the sense that it also meets our material needs, right? There's housing, there's education, uh, there's food and, and so forth. Um, but it's also about the connection between them, right? That we need kind of goodness in our enoughness, right? We're also emotional beings. We're also environmentally dependent beings. And so you can't really have these two separated. And I, I really like how the world combines all of those different meanings into it. And so that's that's the kind of broad idea about the good enough life. And people ask me sometimes, you know, well, what exactly is enough? Like, is, is this amount of money enough? Or is it like this amount, you know, this size house? And I do think that that has to be somewhat dynamic and historical and, and evolving. Um, it's, it, I think the world will change as we keep changing, as we keep getting different things. So, uh, you know, what kind of constitutes enoughness will vary. You know, if you live in a place that doesn't have access to clean drinking water, um, water purification systems are part of enoughness, whereas, you know, that's not immediately something I, I need to worry about here. Um, the internet is not something that existed 70 years ago. Whereas now I think, you know, a feeling of connectivity and, and a kind of comprehension of the world probably requires some degree of access. So things like that will keep changing. And I think that's good. So I, I don't sort of say, you know, this is exactly what I mean. But I think we all have a, a kind of sense of, you know, there are some bare minimums, of, you know, what we need to survive. And then those things can keep getting kind of gooder, better uh, as, as we grow and develop. So I guess on, I don't want to be too, too narrow or too parochial here, but uh and I guess on the uh, kind of parsing out the words as you tell, kind of talking about the origins about good and enough, enough sounds like you're describing basic needs, right? So basic needs of food, water, shelter, clothing, I think in a <clears throat> modern world, um, <laughs> some type of broadband internet uh, or some kind of connectivity. Um, you know, basic needs. Is, is that about right on the enough piece? Basic needs, but, you know, I, I like to think we could develop a society in which, right, we're not just talking about you get gruel, like, and okay, that's enough because it, mm -hmm. it keeps you alive, right? It is good enough. Like, there's some goodness even in, in our enoughness, right? And, you know, what would it mean to kind of have it so that people have some, you know, like a room of their own, some degree of kind of privacy. And so, like, the, 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 it's not just, I don't, you know, bare minimum is good, right? Like being able to eat to survive is good, but something that is also infuses that goodness into our enoughness is, you know, is better. Um, and that's, that's sort of what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. And then on the good, is the good part of this some type of um, Aristotelian kind of good? So this, this kind of higher thing, this kind of higher aim that we're shooting for, are you talking about a type of uh, value or moral you're placing in terms of what, what good is? Again, I, I don't want to be too, uh, um, you know, uh, granular on this, but, you know, what, what do we mean by good? Because, you know, for, for, for example, if you take the relativist argument, you know, what's good for me might not be good for you and, you know, so on and so forth for people around the world or you know, culturally or contextually a good for someone in, um, you know, Gabon or Indonesia or, you know, Paraguay or here in the United States mm -hmm. might not be the same for, you know, mm -hmm. for other people around the world. So how do we mean or how are you how are you describing or thinking of uh, uh, the good aspect of it? Yeah, so I, like like enough, I do think it evolves and changes and we develop new vocabularies and new ways of understanding, you know, what we are as humans and what, what we find valuable and what we find meaningful. And a lot of the idea of the book is sort of increasing access for people to be able to explore, like, what, what do they mean by the good? How do they understand the good? Um, and it's certainly true that, right, people in different countries or different parts of the world or even different regions within a given country um, will have very different conceptions of, of what counts uh, as a good life. Um, I have some kind of specific philosophical kinds of arguments that I, that I can make against relativism and, and what I call a kind of good enough universalism. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, my, my basic basic thought here is that this really should be something that that is we are all humans um i understand the political uh, and cultural meaning of, of nations and cultures um, but that this should be something that that would would be broadly available right the kind of goods and the kinds of enoughness that, that i would like to see but you know, not tomorrow right but in the kind of development of this um, wouldn't be like well this country's doing like well enough you know like things are pretty good in sweden right now and so like yay they made it it's 
Well, how did Sweden get to that position, right? Did, did they do it all internally? Did it rely on networks of trade or um, did it rely on kind of pasts of, of kind of colonial labor practices? You know, how do we kind of think through some of this, this long history? Um, and then how do we think about the problems that happen when um, it seems like the goodness in the world is kind of limited in some places, right? To what extent are wars driven by a sense that, hey, they've got it really good over there or they have something that we want in order to make our lives better. And so let's make their lives worse. You know, I, that's the kind of thing that I, I think we live with too much. Um, and that a good enough world really is a good enough world. And then this would be a kind of broader question. It would not mean, therefore, that everyone lives exactly the same way. Um, you would have no dynamism there, right? We'd, we'd wind up kind of stuck. Okay, this is what good means and we're done and everyone has it. I don't think we could do that, but even if we could, right, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't feel right because part of what it means to be human is to grow and expand and, and change um, and, and develop these new ideas. So so that's the good enoughness of this universalism in part is just it's keeping up. OK, like maybe this country breaks up its uh, ways of organizing into smaller units of 6,000 people. And this one is more of representative democracy. And this country is like a little more hierarchical, but the people at the top of the hierarchy don't have that much more than everyone else. Like there's, I mean, there's various ways I could imagine um, these kinds of things working out. But that that's the, that's the it's not like a one size fits all model here, uh, very, very much against that. But it is saying like there are recognizable standards for for things that are bad right like nobody likes to be tortured nobody likes to be dominated i mean at least you know for their whole lives um right people may have particular uh ways they like relating right, relating to others in, in their personal lives and, and that's something that's you know not really the purview of this book but right like these kind of broad categories um yeah and i, I mean this is this is the problem for me with the relativist argument not not me alone but the idea here would just be that um, the claim of pluralism of we get to organize things differently is that each of us has the the right to determine how we want to to say what makes something good, stake out our kind of claims in life. And if you're saying, well, my kind of pluralism means that I get to dominate these other people, then your, your claim to pluralism invalidates the whole argument, right? You're saying that because of my specific way of being, I get to do this to other people, you're denying them the very pluralism that you're claiming for yourself. And so you kind of wind up in that contradiction. So that, that kind of um, relativism, relativism of just, well, anything goes doesn't really worry me because it's, it's self-contradictory, um, at least at a philosophical level, at a practical level, humans are complicated. Um, but that, that's the kind of why I don't think it falls into a relativist argument where it does kind of have a kind of open pluralist, different ways of doing things. Hmm. So it seems as if the good enough life is a type of revaluing of society in the world. Is this a, is this a fair way to put it? That there's a kind of, you, you, you talk about a, uh, a way in which not everyone's the same. It, it doesn't look the same everywhere, but that there is a type of uh, different structure at a basic level where people can have uh, a bare minimum. How, how do you see this potentially as a, a revaluing of society in the world? Yeah, I'd, I'd love, there's a, there's a quote from uh, Michael Young, who's a British uh, sociologist, and he coins the term meritocracy, and, and he means it uh, very negatively, right, that a meritocracy. And I, I pulled this quote out as I was thinking earlier today. And so um, Young says, right, in his ideal society, there's equal opportunity for all people irrespective of their intelligence, to develop the virtues and talents with which they are endowed, all their capacities for appreciating the beauty and depth of human experience, all their potential for living to the full. And instead of equal opportunity, right, meaning, you know, we all get our chance to prove why we deserve more than someone else, but instead of equal opportunity to really explore what, what makes you, whatever amazing talents you have or whatever not so amazing talents you have, right? To be someone who is a meaningful part of, of their world and to experience that complexity of the human experience. Um, so that's the kind of revaluing that I think the good in life, life heads towards by saying, again, things are imperfect. There's no great few who are going to save us, but all of us together can work together to make something that, that is decent, that is sufficient, that is meaningful, and that collaboratively, right, we can, we can build on the powers and the energies of 7.7, you know, 7.8 7 billion people instead of, right, the kind of 
merit, meritocratic slice. Uh, so that, I mean, you know, there's various ways in which this is a kind of revaluing, but, but another thing that the phrase good enough captures, I didn't even say in the meeting, I think there's so much packed in it, but is that kind of ordinary everydayness, right? That kind of decency of, of all of us in, in our complexity, um, including sometimes like some not so great things about us, but that we can work on and transform um, and, and become better through, through that process of, of working together. So I, you know, I think I know this sounds kind of sometimes a bit soft and, and idealistic and naive, but I'm, you know, I'm okay with that. Like, I think that's an okay position to take. I guess the, the question here would also be, does this have to be where everyone kind of buys in? So if, if everybody is not, you know, buying into this, um, would it still be functional, right? If, if there's some people are like, well, I don't care. You know, I don't, I don't care about how, how to do this. or I don't care about my neighbor or the next person or the person in, you know, name your, your uh, other place. You know, does it, does it need to be a kind of everyone buys into it or it doesn't work? How does that kind of, I guess this is a little bit more of a pragmatic argument, whereas the, obviously we have human f uh, flaws. Um, where, does it, where do we factor that potential kind of uh, variable where things will go wrong or, or where not everyone's kind of keyed into this? Sure. No, I think that, you know, with any system or any kind of moral vision of, of the world, that that is part of what happens. And I think that's kind of built into the good enough model is like, OK, this isn't going to work out perfectly. Um, but I also think it's the case that um, the way institutions work or, or the way that society functions is, you know, most people don't want to get up. At, at 7 a.m., take their kids to school, work from nine to five, right? But people do it, you know, like you don't have to necessarily buy into all the elements. And the the argument is, right, okay, but if you do all these things, right, like, you know, life is going to work out for you. And if you kind of, you know, do your part in, in the world as we currently have it structured, you know, you're going to, you're going to receive the, the benefits of your hard work and so on and so forth. And I think, you know, anyone who's studied this in, in that sees that, that 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 argument doesn't really work, right? People can work three jobs, four jobs. They can get unlucky. They can have a bad break here or there. They can just not, you know, kind of have things sink in their lives for whatever set of reasons, and and not have things work out. And that's in fact a large a large part of the population. Um, and so, you know, the argument of the book isn't that everyone has to necessarily buy into the whole thing. You know, I think it's, but but if we kind of craft some of our institutions, some of our way of thinking, some of our norms and values around kind of what's good and what's enough as opposed to this kind of competitive system of some people make it, some people don't, um, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for not, um, then, then we can have a kind of more, more flourishing and, and viable society. So, and I think more people, you know, when you see, I think societies that have something that looks more like this, right, societies that have a bit more equality and a bit more kind of assurance of decency, people tend to buy into those societies more, right? You, you do see, um, you know, Scandinavian countries, especially but not exclusively, uh, are places where people kind of trust their government, right? They trust each other. Um, the, those kind of social democratic states it was, was the pandemic, I think, really revealed a lot of this, right? Places like New Zealand or, or Canada or Taiwan, right? Or also Scandinavia, like fared a little better because of that social cohesion. Um, and so the system does some of the work, right? You don't individually, you know, I don't buy into the philosophy that I'm more or less compelled to live by, right? Like as a writer, if I want to get my work out there, I do have to compete with other writers for attention. I have to try to kind of get my, you know, work to the top of the bestseller list. I don't think this is exactly a bestseller, right? But like, I'm still kind of out there trying to, to make my way through or as an academic, I have to you know try and write more or, or write more interestingly than other people. That's not how I, I would organize the world personally, but that's how I kind of find myself. And so I go by it. So if we change some of these systems and some of these ways in which we reward people or don't reward people, I think it would also follow that the behavior would change um, in a, in a non-oppressive way, right? in a way that would be, okay, I get, you know, like, I, I really, I, I see and appreciate and I feel respected by this, this social system. Um, so that, that would be the somewhat practical response. So, you know, obviously, um, where the rubber hits the road is where all sorts of interesting complexities come up and really thinking through these kind of institutional details is not something I'm especially, you know, like I said, I have a background in kind of literature philosophy, but I think, you know, though it can't be divorced, right? There are empirical questions that really matter. Um, so it's important to, to think those through. And I think most of, a lot of good ideas go bad, right? Where we don't kind of pay attention. 
attention how they interact with people's lives the kinds of uh, a system like more of a voice um would enable us to learn more get better feedback from a wider variety that's at least you know that's the theory so maybe people that have been listening thus far will say well I mean, look, I mean, this all sounds, you know, super nice and this sounds great, but I mean, you're just, you're basically asking people to just kind of settle, right? Like this is good enough, right? There's this kind of almost implicit attitude maybe people might have about this where it's like, well, I just have to just, you know, just, just, you know, have what's good enough, you know, nothing, nothing too, too fantastical, nothing that's going to make my neighbor not be able to, you know, thrive a little bit better than me or, or even for myself or, you know, what do you make about the claim that maybe, um, does it kind of, could it, you know, if you're, I think that the, the, the challenge here would probably be, um, a sense of scaling, right? You got 8 billion people on the planet and no one's going to buy into everything. Mm -hmm. But like the idea of, well, would this create people that are too lazy or their type of malaise or, you know, really cavalier or, or, or not as invested in certain things. If it's just yeah, good enough, good enough for me, it doesn't need to be, you know, um, you know, better or, or something like that. What do you make to, I guess, that claim? Excuse me. Yeah, thanks. No, and I think that's, this is a, an interesting and important question. Um, when I say good enough, I, I mean, at some level, I do kind of mean like, let's do a little bit less, let's be a little more relaxed. Like everyone, you, you just see it everywhere, right? You talk to people that burn out, they're stressed, they're anxious, they're depressed. Um, but at the same time, right, they're like, but I have to keep striving and I have to do more and I have to be excellent. I have to be the best. And so this, there's this kind of contradiction in, in our desires. And I am probably pushing us more to the, let's deal with the fact that we're all stretched out and, and anxious and depressed. And, and you know, how can we kind of think that through in one way is, well, having more people doing a bit less individually. I don't, I don't think that's such a bad idea. Um, but doing what they do, I, the book is not in any way, I try to say this many times, like there's nothing against ex excellence. There's nothing against like, like you know, I, I write all the time. Like I'm kind of constantly writing. Some of it makes its way into the world. Some of it does. So I guess the, the one thing I want to ask about with the good enough life is, so you've talked about like, you know, are, are we just asking people to settle or not? But I guess the one on the other flip side, which we haven't mentioned yet, which you spend a lot of time in the book is about greatness so um i think you you say at different points in the book about how you're trying to clarify that you're not necessarily against greatness uh but of course every time i read it, i'm like oh he hates greatness which isn't true but <laughs> um what is the when, when you're kind of you're my, my mind you're kind of making this juxtaposition between the good enough life and the great life and how you uh, you make the claim in the book that striving for greatness um while it might be for some people you know for some folks personally such as maybe athletes or you know movie stars or something like that not necessarily a bad thing at a personal level but where we're where we're creating or enforcing or incentivizing social systems to push for greatness. That is more detrimental. Do I do I have the the kind of framing of what you're saying pretty pretty accurately? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, greatness is a is a word that can mean right various different things, and so it's I, I'm trying to get a kind of specific definition in the book, which I do generally say this is the kind of thing that I'm I'm concerned with, worried about, you know, opposed to. It's not the adjective great, right? I'm not saying never say this is a great book or he's a great father. What a great podcaster. Or, she's such a nice, great friend. Um, those are all, you know, whatever. I mean, that's fine. Um, and do people do great things? Of course, you know, like um, people will say, you know, what about Gandhi or Martin Luther King? Like, aren't they great? Sure, they're great. That's that's fine. Um, my concern is what I kind of talk about this you know, system of greatness or a kind of regime of greatness. And, and what I mean by that is just a, a way of organizing our lives that is designed to find those who are considered the best and then give them all. I mean, let, let me let me step back, actually, because I started this by, by talking about, you know, good enough as a response to imperfection. You know, how do we deal with the fact that life has these problems? And I think the positive argument for greatness is to say, 
what do we do with that life has problems, right? Not everyone can have everything they want. Well, if we find the most talented, innovative, wonderful people, and we give them the resources and the time and everything they need in order to develop their talents, it's going to benefit all of us, right? If we if we give Albert Einstein enough time in his lab, he's going to come up with some amazing things and he's going to, you know, advance humanity. And if we give, I mean, people who I don't, I wouldn't say this about, but other people say like, if you give Elon Musk enough resources, right? Like he's going to make an amazing battery that's going to change, you know, revolutionize everything. Or, you know, you give Monsanto enough, they're going to come up with, with the crops that'll be resistant to climate change, whatever it might be, right? But we find like these most talented things and the, and the people who, you know, are the kind of smartest at what they do. And we put all our resources on, it's going to be better for everyone else. And I, I don't think that that argument is entirely false, right? I do think it's true that they're incredibly talented people and a lot we benefit from inventions and from entrepreneurs. We benefit also in other spheres of life, right? From artists or writers who are deemed great and, you know, we give them support to pursue their work and so forth. Um, my concern, though, I mean, I have a few concerns about this. Um, then the reason I pose not so much like people doing what they can and, and doing like, like, you know, what, what they find excellent or meaningful, right. But people kind of fighting to show that they deserve more, right. That, that's really the kind of part of this that worries me because on the one hand, if you have, you know, what, what greatness implies is the kind of relativity where right? you are greater than something else. It, it's not a, it's not like we can all be great, right. But I mean, by definition, right. You are greater than something else. You can all be excellent, right. We could all be like, really good at something but we cannot be great at least in this this kind of model of thinking about things um the idea is that there really are some kind of grades out there and so if you have that system one you need to kind of figure out who it is that deserves all of these resources and time and we don't have a good way of doing that i mean you, I can, you can go into examples or you can look into the data um but you can just imagine or understand that Albert Einstein himself, uh, for example, when you read his biography, he spends like six, seven years wandering, jobless, right? He's kind of tutoring here and there. He's writing all these letters, begging for things because he's kind of this wild, brash, bold thinker and, and, and his you know, superiors don't really like him. Um, and it's possible, right, that the scientific establishment could have rejected him entirely. And there's this amazing quote that I have in the book from Stephen Jay Gould, um, uh, paleontologist, evolutionary biologist, and 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 cool. You know the story of Einstein's brain is kind of wild, but it gets stolen and dissected and chopped up. And that you know, Stephen Jay Cool is asked at some point, you know, what do you think about Einstein? You know, did Einstein have a special brain? And in this essay, he says, um, you know, I don't care about Einstein's brain. I care that people of equal talent died in sweatshops and cottons. And what one way of one positive argument for greatness is to sort of say. Well, we need to fix that, right? So that no, we don't lose any Einsteins, and everyone gets what they they have, you know what. But right, the the kind of way this actually works out when we have a society that's so geared toward finding the best and promoting the best and giving everything to the best is that people are going to fight to be that, and we're not going to be able to find these people, and we're going to wind up with exclusions. We're going to wind up with people who have amazing talents who never get recognized, who do, as Gould says, die in sweatshops and cotton fields. That is part of this system of trying to find the best and giving them the most is that everyone else, in theory, maybe gets these trickle down effects, but is kind of ripped out. And if this greatness system worked, I think it would have worked somewhat already, right? We wouldn't have a society that has, you know, Credit Suisse will say something like $400 trillion in wealth and 40% of the human population living in, in poverty. Like you can't square those things and say, well, but if we just keep giving more and more to the best, eventually it is going to help everyone else out. I'm not saying that right, innovation isn't good or that smart people shouldn't be rewarded or, or you know, like get the, to kind of pursue their experiments. But I am also asking us to think about right, what this does to a society um, and to think about you know, when you have, I mean, I could go into kind of endless detail because it is, it is hard of the book here. Um, but when you have something like uh, funding for a new kind of um, technology to help us deal with climate change, right? Is the technology that gets supported in this kind of model, especially if, if the economy is especially thing that defines greatness, is it going to be the technology that actually immediately deals with climate change? Do we in fact have those technologies already, but they contradict other kind of business models? Are we going to actually lose the kinds of things we need because we're so obsessed with kind of finding the best and rewarding the best? And instead of sort of saying, well, what's good enough? Like the planet is on fire. How do we deal with that? Well, here's what we need to do politically and here's what we need to do technologically and let's set about it. That's not what we're saying, right? We're saying 
you know, or at least Richard Branson is saying, well, I'm going to give $20 million to the best idea for someone who comes up with, you know, how to fix this problem, as if that's what incentivized people. But if you talk to a climate activist or, you know, you talk to a scientist who's researching this kind of thing, they, they don't need $20 million. They just need the planet not to, to burn and, and to, to create climate refuge. Right? So I think there's this kind of misunderstanding of what motivates and incentivizes people. Um, some people do need reward. I'm sure there are people out there who are, you know, like, if I can't make this much money, then I'm not going to bother doing it. But I think there's probably lots of talented people who can deal with the problems we need to, who are incentivized by lots of other things um, and living in a decent and caring and sustainable world being one of them. So that's, I mean, I, I know that, that's a kind of broad way of saying, like, would it be great if we came up with, with a new way of generating energy that, that had no... Um, climate impact, of course, that would be great. And I'm happy to call that great. But will the system of greatness kind of get us there? And if it, get us, if it gets us there, will that you know, thing that we've invented there become, thereby become available to everyone? Probably not, right? Some countries will say, well, you've got to pay us to do this, or you know, you've got to, there's going to be this kind of political operations or machinations, or we're going to create some new kind of social strife, or who knows, right? This is what we saw with the vaccine, right? We came up with a vaccine, but not everybody could get it. And you can imagine similar things for climate change. So that's, you know, these are the kinds of examples that make me say, well, yeah, great acts, good. You know, people doing amazing things, wonderful, but a way of kind of organizing society around this isn't actually getting us there. It's, it's somewhat self-defeating. So I, th I think that if I'm understanding you that you want it where things and or people and their ideas aren't being left out because we overemphasized the best ideas. Is there a world or place where both can coexist at a, at a, at a large scale? So let me... So I have that question. I have another question. So, so here's, let me give an example. Now there's problems with this example. I'll say that up front. So, okay. um, but my, my first thing is, is the world of sport, right? Now I'll, I'll just tell this story. So personally for me, when I watch sports, I want to see greatness. That's what I want to see. I don't want to see average. I don't want to see mediocre. I don't want a new champion every year. I don't want any of that shit. I want to see the dynasty. I want to see, because to me, whether it's an individual sport or it's a team sport, how are you able to be and stay at the top and stay motivated and to stay at all these kinds of ways, that passion year in, year out, right? How... Like it means something when, when Tiger Woods, you know, comes back after so many years and wins the Masters for a fifth time, you know, his 15th major. It's insanity that, you know, Rafael Nadal has won 13 French Opens. That doesn't seem human. Or Tom Brady's been to 10 Super Bowls and won seven of them. Or Serena Williams has won 23 Grand Slams. Why? Well, I, I mean... And when they're playing, right, uh, the French Open's around the corner. I, I mean, obviously, Nadal's the favorite. I want him to win a 14th. I don't want somebody to win their first. I mean, if it happens, I'll be fine with it. But I want him to win his 14th. If Roger Federer comes back, I'd love to see him win a ninth Wimbledon. Of course. Of course. Tom Brady's got a year or two left. You know, he retired and then unretired. Love to see him win an eighth Super Bowl. I mean, we... we, we we look for those things. We want those things. We want the, 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 the dynasty or the greatness because it, it's, it's, it's the closest thing we get to like, I don't know, superheroes or something. And, you know, isn't that, isn't that something that can be, I mean, I think in some ways it can be inspiring, right? People say like, well, look at these, look at Michael Jordan, you know, he won six, you know, uh, championships, never lost a final, never even went to game six in the final. I mean, it's just, you know, he's, he's the best. He's the greatest. Mm -hmm. Why you're saying we shouldn't have that. We should have just given the, the, all those resources and money and incentives to all the other kids that didn't get a shot, but you know, we would have not had a Michael Jordan or Tom Brady or Serena Williams. I mean, how do we, how do we, how, can we have both things or, or how, how do we square that? 
Yeah, I mean, so there's, there's a lot. I think that's a really good question and um, a really good example. And there's various ways to, to discuss it, right? But one one is just that um, the increasing research right, on, on childhood sports play right, shows us that a lot of these people who want to be the next whatever burn out much more quickly. And so a lot of great youthful talents were actually losing because of this system of saying, okay, you've got to be the best. You've got to play, you know, like Tiger Woods practiced every minute that he wasn't eating or sleeping his entire life and whatever. And so, you know, if you want to be the next Tiger Woods, you have to do exactly the same thing. And I mean, it's amazing that people can do this. You know, it takes, a, it takes an emotional toll, obviously, but also right, we are losing some of this talent because of that process. So there's, there's one, one question there. Um, Another element of this is is not at all the same. Like I, I basically agree with you. I'm like, yes, like I, I love watching like amazing talents, and, and um, that's a it's a beautiful thing to do. But what right, what follows from that? Okay, mm-hmm. is it the case that um, because you have a specific talent at a specific thing, uh, you should be able to um, amass great amount of wealth in such a way that you are distorting right other people's well-being and so if you look and i don't mean that individually you're just sort of like you're doing something bad but i mean the way that a, a sports system works is that um citizens pay for the stadiums uh the people who grow and make the food and sell the food are terribly underpaid and underworked and i'm during the pandemic like that was by the worst hit sector uh, uh you know when it came to the sports things the athletes were fine the owners were fine no teams folded right lots of people lost their jobs um we have public education, like we all kind of also contribute in various ways. We build roads, we, we have education systems, we have public schools that can coach people and so on and so forth. And so I think for me, it's not so much about saying, well, this person isn't an amazing athlete or like we should, you know, get rid of this kind of excellent uh, person and, and their ability or we should not, not get rid of them, but like, you know, diminish their abilities in any way. It's to sort of say, what would a world look like in which Everyone in that picture, right? Everyone who makes this this sport possible and makes our ability to watch it possible and enjoy it possible, what would it mean that they all have good enough lives? And is it conceivable that that you can have, right, the system that we have where there are people who make hundreds of millions of dollars what they do and people who get paid seven dollars an hour? Um, is there some way that people who make, you know, well, seven fifteen an hour, um, or depending on the city, fifteen dollars an hour? Like, is there some way that, you know, we can have all of that go to that one person, but still have everyone else, you know, live well enough? And we haven't proven that yet in any meaningful sense that you can live a good enough life as a concession worker for your for your whole life. And if we can make that happen, right? That that's one thing. But that is that's really my concern is we're really distorting the system. I mean, there's a there's maybe also kind of a, two other broader questions here one being you know how how good is sports as an analogy um sports is i think a pretty interesting pretty interesting meritocratic like it's kind of obvious what makes a good athlete people might disagree about like is you know Mm -hmm. james better is jordan better is nadal whatever better you know like you could have those kinds of disagreements but in a way like what's a great work of art or like what's a great novel or what's a useful invention or like is Facebook good for society, right? These have become much more kind of complicated questions. I think sports is always a kind of tricky one um, because it has such obvious metrics. Um, There's also a a kind of question in terms of resources, you know, Malcolm Gladwell in um, Outliers, I don't know where he gets some, I forget who does the research, original research, but he talks about this example of hockey players and I can't remember the details, but it has something to do with what year they're born. And, you know, when, sorry, what, when in the year they're born and if they're born like at a time when they're going to be the biggest in their mm-hmm. class, because they're going to be a year ahead. Like, I forget what month it is, but some ridiculous percentage of I think athletes. It's are, November or February or something. I think it's. What yeah. Right. So like, because they're the biggest when they're doing the, the tryouts or whatever, right. there's a ridiculous number of people who wind up being in the NHL based on that, which suggests, you know, I think Gladwell interprets it as saying, well, you know, we're losing all this talent, but it also suggests that if you put more resources into people because at a particular time place, actually they could develop and they could be much more talented than they are. Um, and so, you know, I don't know that that system is, is fixable because again, there's a kind of finite amount of resources. And so at the end of the day, I think it's great. Like let's, let's keep having these wonderful competitions. If, if it's really, you know, anyway, we could also talk about there are cooperative ways to play sports. Like some sports don't have to be about winners and losers, but that's another, maybe a, maybe a broader topic. But if we have this and, and, and people find it really meaningful, um, what would it mean right, to kind of have a society that can, can 
have some talent and have some people get probably more attention than others, right? Kind of maybe a little bit more than others, but not so much more that we wind up with these distortions. And one of the things I talk about in the book is this amazing ad that LeBron James does for Nike. And he sort of says, you know, tells his own stories. You grow up in the projects in, in Akron, outside Akron, and, and you um, you rise, you know, through the ranks and you become this player. And it's meant to be the story of the American dream and like how wonderful is that? And then, you know, he flips it at the end of the ad and he says, you know, it'd be wonderful is if you didn't have to do that. <laughs> what would be amazing is if, right, you just, you kind of like lived a decent life and then maybe you were really talented at something, maybe you weren't, but, you know, it still worked out okay. Um, and so that's kind of, I'm interested in, you know, James's kind of social critique um within that ad of the system from which he's he's wound up benefiting from but it's it's kind of an interesting position he takes there yeah so i I think i I say a lot about it um in part because i think it's a really it's a good challenge to my model um but those are the kinds of concerns that that i would have there's um there's a uh, a show on uh, on Apple TV Plus called Greatness Code. It's a type of mini docu series or whatever. And I'm going to assume that you uh, that's not your favorite show. <laughs> I haven't seen it. No, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> it, it has a lot of the greats: you know, the Tom Brady and I think Lil uh-huh. James and you know all these people uh-huh. telling about their story. But um, I, there's something that is a pull for people. Like, look. Mm-hmm. There's some people that I, I think a lot of people, so I'll, I'll finish one thing with the sports analogy and then I'll, I'll I actually have a, a kind of a, a counter to one of the other things you said. Hmm. Look, in, in sports, it is a little different. It is not a fair analogy, but we know as, as a spectator, <laughs> we want that. Right now, as a player, maybe it's a little bit different, but it's a smaller pool, right? You know, but yeah, I mean, as a spectator, you want to see that you want to go for that. Now, obviously there's you know, spectators, you know, fans that will just be, that's their team and doesn't matter. They win or lose, whatever, but mm-hmm. people will want to see that in the United States. People mm-hmm. like the underdog story or whatever, which is less interesting to me. But, um, but you know, I think that a lot of people do want to see the greatness piece with, with the kind of in the, in the, in uh, removed from the sports analogy is, um, so you were, t- you were saying about how certain people in the workforce, and again, I would say that, so everybody has a role to play in society. Not everyone's going to be a lawyer. Not everyone's going to be a doctor, a surgeon, you know, have a fortune 500 company, an entrepreneurial, everyone's got a role. Everyone's got a, got a, got a, a role to play, you know, and if I take the, you know, Bernie Sanders populism, you know, we need to have a living wage. I, I can, in theory, get down with that. Like I, I, I can understand and, and I can, I can totally agree with that. Right. And I definitely don't think, and I think, I think in some European countries, uh, you know, there is a type of, um, ethos or, or, or value system of each, literally each person's job has value. Right. And so that's, they have a, you know, again, less people and in some countries are more homogenized, but there's a little bit of a kind of social, um, agreement, uh, social contract to use the Durkheim, uh, uh, word, but of, um, look at a bare minimum, we're going to take care of everybody. And some people are going to they're going to just they're going to just shoot up the ladder and good, good for them. But that doesn't mean that other people couldn't if they want to. And, you know, even if they don't, even if they're good enough, can they still have um, at a bare minimum things to live well in life? I think that's all true, but I don't think that means you have to strip away from certain types of merit based types of things. Uh, how do we have certain incentives? And look, I mean, the person that works at the Rite Aid um, is doing it, or the person that's, you know, stocking stuff at the Target or whatever, right? Whatever big store, whatever. They're not less important as a human, but it is fundamentally different than the person that's doing heart transplants. There's a fundamental difference there. And that, I'm not saying that that makes people that do that great. I'm not implying that at all. What I am saying though, is that there is a difference. And sometimes that difference 
again, it depends on which country you're in. And in the United States, there are, look, there's wealth inequality, income inequality. Um, certain systems are, have been historically uh, not as inclusive of many different uh, population groups, et cetera. There's all of those things. But, I mean, there are some ways in which it is said that, hey, you know, for some people, these things should be incentivized. You know, I, I, want the, I want the person that's doing surgery on my brain, I want them getting paid, you know, $1.5 million a year or whatever it is, right? You know, $750,000 a year. I don't want them getting paid seven fifty dollars an hour because I want my brain to work, right? I don't want that. And so I'm fine with the merit. I'm fine with the incentive. And maybe they had to work super hard. Maybe they got lucky. Maybe they had some shortcuts, whatever, like everyone does. But there's always just going to, there's, when you're looking at the landscape within an economy or within a, in a system, a social system, you're going to have different roles and different, different uh, uh, responsibilities that people carry out. And sometimes that is because people aren't interested in being a brain surgeon. They're, they don't have the drive or the motivation. They don't have the interest. They don't have the passion, but they really enjoy, um, you know, being doing computer science or, you know, IT work and it's to go, they make a good living and then they come home and they do all the other stuff they like doing and that's totally fine for them. So I guess in this sense, how, 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 how do we make all these things fit together? Because so there's an even more applied piece that I want to get to, but I'll, I'll, I'll hold off on that. How do we have a, 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 a a global society is really hard, but you know, whatever society, Western society, whatever society you want to look at, a place where everyone is treated or everyone's potential um, uh, jobs or vocations or careers, et cetera, that the value is placed on the person and that they have enough for, for what they want to do. But then there is also still enough within a system that if someone wants to just just shoot all the way up and just go all the way and, and do all these things that that's there as well, because I wouldn't want that to go away either because that's how we do have Steve jobs, you know, Einstein, you know, all, all the, you know, all these people that make all these innovative things. How do we see them kind of, uh, uh cohabitating the same space in society? So, I mean, just on the, I'll kind of start where you started and um, as best as my memory can piece it back together, because I think you're raising a number of um, important points. So first, just as, as a kid, you know, I was a Buffalo Bills fan and I was a Goran Ivanisevich fan. You know what I mean? Like, um, <laughs> Goran eventually won, Bills still haven't made it. Yeah. But, um, you know, it, it, there is, and I think this is part of it, is, is not, not all of us, right? Are, like, it's not that interesting to me, if not always. I never really like watching Jordan, like, um, you know, I don't know, I'm from Philadelphia. I watch the Sixers lately. I'm really impressed by the way they're playing. But, you know, <laughs> it's not, it's, sometimes it's really, it is interesting to, like, I, you know, I grew up always, not even the underdog, but like the guy who was like pretty good, but just didn't win. It got balls like, oh, Sampras again. You know, like, I mean, that was, you know, when I started growing up. So it was just, and right. anyway, you know, Michael Chang, why did Michael Chang ever win? Uh, anyway, <laughs> as a short person also, you know, I had a special <laughs> thing, but, um, but you liked when the Eagles won, no? I mean, it, it, even if you're yeah. a Bills fan, I mean, that was, a, that was a good look for the Eagles. They never won. They, yeah. They've been close, and that's that's nice. But I kind of like that when you said, you know, you kind of love the dynasties, and I, I can totally understand that. But also, I, I don't, you know, like, it's exciting for me, like, when a team that hasn't won wins. I'm like, oh, that's sure. kind of cool. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. You know, so, I, I mean, this is, a, this is a, maybe a... Maybe a side point, um, but I can I can see like a system. You know, it would be really interesting to me to kind of see a different team whenever you know to see that most matches are like really good. Like as a fan, I could make a case. I think that rather than having a team that wins, you know, whatever eighty games a season or um, one hundred and thirty in baseball, whatever, like that all the teams are pretty good and every match is like a real match. Like every game is a real game. And um, that seems kind of exciting to me as another model rather than like, I guess we can go watch the Patriots, you know, blow out whomever or the Bucks. I don't, I mean, it's hard to kind of make that as a sentence, watch the Bucks. But, um, but anyway, sorry, no offense to Tampa Bay. Um, so, so then <laughs> come back to, I think the, the, the point you're making here, which is, which is really interesting. So, 
um, it, a couple of things, right? The, the, the Einstein, I mean, there's a couple of, of ways to, to go about thinking about this from, from my point of view, and I can totally understand and appreciate your, your point of view there. It, I don't really want my brain surgeon to be making that much money. Um, I don't think that's a particularly good incentive sure. for them. Sure. And in fact, you know, sometimes I've had surgeries by people who are making a lot of money and what they're doing is it's almost like being in a, in a factory where it's like, mm -hmm. you know, in order to be the top surgeon, you have to do so many surgeries and they have to be so successful. And um, in order for them to be successful, you kind of have to tick some boxes. And so maybe you don't actually do all the care and the follow up, sure. um, but it's really just about kind of being the top surgeon and, and doing the most successful surgeries and whatever that metric is. Um, but I also, you know, it, if I were to design a society that I want to live in, I really want the brain surgeon to think what I care about is the health and well-being of my patient. And so I don't care a who my patient is, but I don't care if my patient is um, the president of the United States or, or the person working at Walmart. Like they matter to me. Um, and so I'm going to do the best that I can. And so we have like a, a more dis equal distribution of talent um, and, and availability of talent. But also, you know, the country has a doctor shortage. I, I don't know the numbers in other countries. Right. But like there's lots of ways in which our, our kind of obsession with like, again, kind of. Uh, well, anyway, that, that's maybe a different point, but um, it does. It just doesn't follow for me, right? That you need to be rewarded in this kind of way with this kind of um, prestige and, and power and money um, because of what you do, and that you shouldn't be, right? Because you, you just didn't, you know, what, what Catherine Page Harden calls the genetic lottery. Right? You didn't win the genetic lottery, and so you know you don't get to live your whole life. Like you don't get to live a good life at all because you know where you you only make seven fifteen. I'm not to say. Sorry, I also don't want to mean it in this way. You can live a good life, right? You can totally live yeah. a decent and meaningful life, no matter how much money you make, no matter how much difficulty you experience. And and people who do that are kind of like amazing and and, and mm -hmm. wonderful in, in lots of ways. Um, but I think there is suffering and difficulty that we impose on people uh, socially, you create for ourselves and for each other by not respecting and rewarding our, our various dispositions and talents, whatever they might be. And that, that is part of my vision here. And, you know, I think that's, that, that for me makes sense. Um, the other thing I say, and I, I hear this, I think this is sometimes a, a difference in worldview where some people, I would say I'm probably more concerned about inequality. And from what you're saying, it sounds like you're probably more concerned about poverty. Like it doesn't really matter how much the person at the top makes so long as everyone is I'm doing okay. I, I, maybe I'm not phrasing your position well, but, but people who, who say things, something like what you've said, uh, have said to me along those same lines, right? Like, mm -hmm. you care about inequality. I care about poverty. I don't care how much the richest person in the world has as long as, you know, everyone's eating and, and doing all right. But those same people, and I, you know, I don't know what you think about this, but I was listening to Alex Tabarak on um, Ezra Klein the other day, George Mason, the economist, and he's really concerned uh, he's a, you know, not, we don't share the same politics or economics, but he's a very thoughtful guy. And he's really concerned about, right, social cohesion, the falling apart of social trust, um, um, fracturing in society, conspiracy theories, like all these things that are kind of making society feel really sure. Uh, and at the same time, he's sort of saying, I have nothing against the floor. I'm totally in favor of like a floor that no one should fall below, but I don't want a ceiling. There can absolutely be no ceiling in, in his world. You have to be able to shoot to the top. And those two things for me are deeply related. And I think the, the social science on this is pretty good, right? Societies that have vast inequality, societies that have inequality, not just of money, right, but of power, the ability to kind of make decisions, um, tend to be societies that experience all the things that he's worried about. And so he starts saying, I don't care about inequality, but I do care about all these problems that are caused by inequality. Mm -hmm. And so unless there's something that I'm, I'm not seeing, but for me, it seems very clear. And what we do see, right, that again, societies that have less inequality tend to have better social trust, better social cohesion. Um, they tend to be able to find and support more entrepreneurs. Those entrepreneurs uh, or you know, inventors or artists or whatever, they may not become as wealthy as they would in some other country, but they're able to kind of bring out their ideas, be part of something meaningful. Um, and I don't, I, that, that seems to me like a much more healthy and holistic vision. And in fact, my sense is that if we keep increasing that, right, we keep kind of spreading and making possible what is available to more people, we'll get more interesting talents and we'll get more interesting ideas and we'll have a more kind of cohesive and, and meaningful social world because we won't be fighting each other to get to the top, right? This kind of system in which you're really kind of 
jostling all the time to prove your, your bestness, maybe it brings out something good in us, but also it brings out so many other bad traits. And I do think it's possible to make a meaningful world where we still have brain surgeons because they love humanity, right? Not because they really just wanted to be the top at their, in their medical school class or whatever. Well, uh, okay. So there's a few things here. <laughs> so, so, so I care about both. So I, I think, I think uh, wealth and income inequality is a major issue, it is a major, major, major issue. Um, on one hand, I personally don't really care if somebody makes billions of dollars. I actually think that that's insanely difficult to manage. I think it's difficult to manage $10 million, right? Like it's a job to manage that much money and no, thanks. I don't, I don't know if I would want to, I don't want to spend half my time managing that. I, I just, it's, 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 you have to hire someone to either do it or whatever. It's, it becomes more problematic. But I actually don't care about that um, in one way. I care about it if it does impact other people. So, so, so when we're talking about different types of wealth that people have over other people in a way that it is causing harm for a society as a whole, yeah, I care about that, right? Mm -hmm. And then in that place, I would say, yeah, I mean, you, you're not going to know or feel the difference. And again, this is a little bit maybe of ignorance on my part because I don't, I don't run these circles. But, you know, the difference between 50 billion and 60 billion is 10 billion, which is a lot of money. It's a, it's a, it's a number I can't fathom. But it is, it, it is an idea of saying maybe there is a ceiling, right? And that's not stunting someone's growth or their wealth. What it's saying is, is that there is so much beyond an individual where it's having adverse impact on everyone else. That's why that's, that there's, a, there's a ceiling that should be there. I would also go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, I would just add that, right? When, when these conversations come up sometimes, you know, with people, you know, friends of mine, people I respect, but, you know, they'll sort of say, well, you know, we're punishing, we're taking away from the people who have all of that. And, you know, my perspective is, what we've been doing for thousands of years is taking away from all the people who do all the little bits of labor that makes possible that great am amassing of wealth, right? It's not like it was natural or necessary that one person got all the stock options. I mean, most of these, right, billionaires, it's stock options. And it's not like that had to be the way that this was designed. Tesla could have been designed such that everyone who worked at that company got some slice of the stock option. It could be that the United States government, when they bailed out Tesla, took an ownership stake. And so you and I right, would, would receive some of the benefits of the growth of the stock market. You know? um, so it's, it's just, it, it's not like, it's, it's not about punishing one person. It's about the fact that we're punishing so many people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how would we kind of, right. yeah. Right, yeah. right. And that's exactly my, where I fall on this too, is if there's an adverse impact on global economy by 20 people that make billions of dollars, there needs to be regulation. There needs to be um, a way in which that's offset. And when we have wealth inequality that is, you know, exponentially growing every year, you know, I, I, I do see some of the, the claims that uh, Piketty makes in his books about how we, we combat this, I think are, are fair. I think they're valuable. And I, I do care about the basil or the, or the floor as well of, well, I just don't want people to be impoverished. You know, if, if, you know, if we, if we kind of check right now for everyone for $300,000 and that's the, everyone's good flat across the board. Great. That's cool too. Right. So I, I'm, I'm not trying to both sides it. I, I get attacked with that all the time. Um, but I, I do think that I don't care how much an individual person makes until I do, <laughs> which is when I do is not because oh, fuck this guy because he makes more money than me or I'm never going to make that much money or I can't pay my student loans or whatever and he's sitting on, you know, money in, you know, uh, uh, you know, whatever offshore account. It's more of no, if there is an in, and I'm not blaming folks like the, you know, Be Bezos or, you know, they work within the rules maybe, but the rules and the systems that are there, th th what are they going to do? They're not going to say, well, I'm going to just, they're, they're following the rules more or less. They, they can't change a financial system. 
So it is what it is, right? So I think that's where it has to come into play where it's like, okay, well, how do we have a bit more regulations? And this has been always an issue. If you go back to the turn of the century with, um, you know, antitrust and, and bank reform and, you know, things like that. And so, you know, I, I think that there's, it's, 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 it's kind of the, the, the perversion or the, um, the, the, the really gross excess of the American dream, I would say, right. I think it's, there is a type, there can be, and should be a ceiling if it is too much over, uh, other people, even if that's indirectly or inadvertently. And so, but, but I, I do think though, with, w- within those systems though, you're right. It's not all about uh, uh, money or financial incentives, but I, I do think um, it is hard. I, I, I'm never fully convinced with this argument or this comparison of Scandinavia f- for or other European countries um, or New Zealand or you know or, or places like that because you know everybody has a different. Every each country has its own history, you know, and they got to that place that they're in because they have you know centuries of history you know or millennia of history um you know it's also i think more difficult because many of those places have five million people seven million people um you know people talk about iceland all the time it's like yeah it's an absolutely beautiful place i loved all of my time there You know, it's got 300 and some thousand people on the whole island. 80% live in Reykjavik. You know, there's 800,000 people in the District of Columbia, right? (laughs) Right. And, but, you know, District of Columbia is literally a created city in 17, whatever it was. Iceland's been around for millennia. You know, I mean, it's just, I think it's hard to, it's it's apples and oranges to me. It's like, yeah, could we maybe... consider or or take some of those ideas and and maybe apply it maybe maybe a little bit but it's not a one-to-one because of you know they're very homogenized that's not a bad thing i I mean i'm not saying that as a negative thing they have less people again i'm not saying that's a negative thing they have a longer history not a negative thing but those are important fundamental differences of okay you can't copy paste for a country that's 250 years old not even, um, that has many, many challenges in a short period. It has 330 million people um, and everyone's from everywhere. And, you know, that's, those, those variables are just not going to translate. Even if you take a country like Germany, which I think is 60 million people maybe, um, population-wise, what is that? I mean, that's, that's not even... You know, a, four, a fifth, a fourth. I mean, however, I don't even know the percentage of what it is for the United States. It's it's so much less, even with all of the recent refugees they have. It's still substantially less, and so it's. I don't know if you know what works for them works for us in exact way because as we've talked about in many different contexts, scaling is always the problem, right? Because as you expand and scale things, it starts to kind of like splinter, it starts to fizzle out, and it. And so there, in some ways, I'm not trying to make some American exceptionalism argument. I'm not trying to do that at all. But I, I am saying that there is some unique things to the United States based on their history, their size, uh, their heterogeneity, all these different components that maybe that wouldn't work. And I, again, I come back to the, the central, central point here, which is how we have so many good things from people that are great or have done greatness or whatever, however you want to say it. And yes, we have many people that have, have had it really terrible uh, historically and, pre- and at present. So how can, I just wonder for, the, for uniquely for the United States, since both of us are, are from the United States, how do we do both? How do we have a space where people can kind of have this, uh, this uh, in terms of greatness, um, this track, right? This way of where, where, where you can do it, this concentration, if you will. And then there's something that is kind of good for everyone else and that anyone could do it if they have motivation, passion, skills, certain investments, et cetera. You know, how do you think we could 
basically how can we have individual greatness and potentially a society of great people you know at the same time um that's yeah that's very complicated so so um i it's not it's not clear to me that what has gone wrong in the united states is a problem I mean, there's a couple aspects of this right one one there's a kind of scale question but you know we have a functioning more or less country to scale right i mean yeah the United States is able to do an amazing amount of things across a very vast space and, and probably more than it should in, in other countries as well. Um, and so, right, there is there is no question about the, the in infrastructural capacities or, or abilities. It's probably more a kind of question of mis mismanagement. And I think, you know, people will often sort of say, well, you know, Scandinavian countries are more, you know, Historically, religiously, ethnically homogeneous, and it's true to an extent. I think they are they are more um, they're not fully so, but but yeah. you know the, the extent to which that's a problem in the United States isn't a problem of heterogeneity per se, right? It's a problem of people not liking people um, mm -hmm. who are coming from different places, and I think this argument's been well made by Heather McGee and um, by others that right, one of the you know she she uses this great example of public pools, and she sort of says. Um, you know, people built in the in the I want to say forties and fifties. You know, there was there was more or less a functioning social democracy here, right? But it was kind of somewhat limited not entirely. And, and there's interesting things about the New Deal, and um, there's arguments on both sides about how it you know helped or hurt uh, Black Americans and Indigenous Americans. But in any case, right? McGee makes this argument that right, they're building all these pools and, and they're like these amazing resources. And I think one of them she writes about can host like 10,000 people. I mean, it's insane. I don't, I don't can't imagine a pool that big, but there it is, I think, in St. Louis. And when, you know, Black Americans sue to get their right to be in the pool, they close the pools, right? So that, you know, one of the problems we have is not so much we have heterogeneity, it's that when we kind of say, let's share the bounty here, right, things close down. And McGee's argument is again, this is bad for everybody. This isn't actually sure. like it's yeah. not like that means that therefore you know white people did better. In fact, you know the largest uh, largest number, not proportion, the largest number of poor people in the United States are white. You know, so so there's no there's no reason though this has to be the case, right? There's nothing in our you know DNA or whatever that says like we have to have racism. Um, so look, there, there's that side of it that I think there are specific sure. historical conjunctures where mistakes were made that if they hadn't been, we actually would be having a very different conversation. I fully agree. Uh, yeah. So, so there's, there's my hope for the United States is like, this actually could happen. And, you know, I don't know, there, there are debates about the, the merits of particular bills or not, but the difference between, you know, a, a six trillion, trillion dollar rewriting of the American social safety net um, and not having N zero, which is what we have at the moment was two senators. Right. I mean, this isn't like it's, you know, so again, the, whether or not that, that particular investment would have been wonderful, I can't say because it didn't happen. Um, but it's not like that was impossible. In fact, it was almost happened to the extent that the United States really would have been kind of massively transformed. And so I, I do think that those those kind, you know, a social democracy can exist here, has existed in, in some ways here. And one thing that I learned reading um, Kelly's book, uh, the second one, I can't remember what it's called. Um, but the, the equally fat second one, I didn't mean the whole thing, but right, he talks about, the, maybe it's in the first one. Anyway, he talks about Sweden and the history of Sweden. And one of the things he says is actually, this was one of the most unequal countries in Europe through the early 20th century. Yeah. And there was a massive labor movement. I mean, there was just this kind of total transformation mm -hmm. where he said, I think, right, like even wealth meant you had more votes. You had like votes per mm -hmm. amount of money you had. But, yeah. and now, right, we sort of think, oh, Scandinavia, like they managed to do this. Um, but but it, it wasn't like it was in the Scandinavian blood or something or, sure, or sure. something written to their history, but it was possible. So I, I do think those kinds of things are, are possible. I think the, the concern that I always have, and this is argument that um, historians like, like um, Rob Berman is her last name, and I'm blanking on her first name, but I made about, you know, kind of Second World War, is that when there is great inequality and fracturing and, and difficulty in society, um, social democracy or something that kind of makes more equality can, can occur. And when it does, you tend to kind of find a... a cooling of passions and you tend to kind of find a more functioning country and when it doesn't you tend to wind up with germany italy mm -hmm. austria right you kind of go in this other direction and so my concern is that the moment we're in if we if we don't manage to do this 
you know, if we don't manage to kind of push through this moment of, of frustration, um, we're going into a very dark place. And I think we've, we've seen kind of images of that. And what's interesting in, in Berman's history, and, and I think also in our moment, you know, I don't, I'm not well read, and I could, should be, and I would like to be in, in some kind of the new right um, discourse. But I think a lot of it, actually, there are over, like, there are people who are very concerned about inequality. Um, there are people who are very concerned about not being able to kind of live a meaningful and decent life, just kind of doing their, their ordinary good things. Um, the direction that they take it in tends to be something that's kind of national focused, not always, but sometimes also racially mm -hmm. focused. Mm -hmm. um, and so though, that's where I think a kind of separation occurs is sort of saying, no, we need, this really does need to kind of work for everybody. I don't know. I mean, that, that's somewhat tentative and, and I'd be opening, open to hearing kind of other positions or perspectives on that. But anyway, yeah, so that, I mean, that's kind of my concern is if we don't succeed at kind of cooling this down and making a site where people kind of feel respected and merited. In terms of the other point you were making about, you know, can we have these kind of great individuals and, and a good enough society? Um, my, my um, you know, some of the things I, I try to address in the book are things that really we did grow as a society right so when we had our kind of social democratic new deal moment and there was a lot of government investment um in technology a lot of the things that we see now right that particular people have monopolized or, or made a lot of money on um touch screens gps uh computers the internet you know like everything really was developed through public funding and through people who worked for the government at a government salary, right? Not necessarily, I mean, maybe some of them might have broke off from companies, whatever, but, but whose you know, primary function was developing of knowledge and things for the public good. Uh, and the ways in which those things developed and paid for, for the public good, then it kind of se separated out. And then we say, you know, look what Steve Jobs did. I mean, Steve Jobs did all sorts of interesting things. But we all paid for the kind of founding technologies, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, not, not mm -hmm. probably you or I personally, right? A generation yeah, yeah, yeah. or two before us. Yeah. And so that, I, it doesn't always seem to me the case that the things that we kind of take to be, well, like if we didn't have this great entrepreneur, we wouldn't have this. Because I, you know, I don't know the names of the people who developed the, the GPS system. And I don't know if they became wealthy off of it. But I do know that it, like all the things I do, I mean, a lot of things I do on my phone are possible because of it. Um, and so, again, it just doesn't seem to me to follow that the only way that we get kind of amazing things is through these amazing individuals. It seems to me more like these amazing individuals kind of draw our attention and soak up a lot of resources for things that, you know, were actually made by all of us in, in some way through our contributions. And that would be a really amazing system to continue. But instead, you know, we've kind of cut in various, various ways. And again, I think the vaccines are a really interesting example of this, where something, you know, mRNA technology is university made, it's, publicly made it's um there were vaccines available university of oxford university of helsinki that could have been produced uh paid for by governments and distributed freely but that wasn't the path we took and you have a lot of people again not people who i agree with uh, about a lot of things but you have a lot of vaccine skepticism from people who say like well it's just big pharma making money and it's those i mean i'm not saying those people are right for saying that you know I, Mm -hmm. uh, but I understand where they're coming from, mm -hmm. and I don't think that was a kind of necessary outcome. So that, these are my kinds of concerns, is that like, we actually can get quite a bit without this model, and we're losing a lot because we're creating these kinds of um, tensions in society. Yeah, it's interesting how... Uh, we've, we've, we've in, in, the, in the social economic sphere, we've, we've, uh, the, we've kind of gone and waded into these waters of... Basically, you're you're making somewhat of the case of a a quasi or actual progressive kind of uh, economy of, of sorts, you know, in, in the political sense, which I, I'm not opposed to uh, uh, necessarily. Um, I guess all I'll say on on some of those bits is, for me personally, th th this is <laughs> this is the thing. I mean, maybe it's just my process, but many of those things I don't disagree with. And in fact, for me personally, you know, a strong centralized federal government is always what makes things uh, turn, I think, right? And yes, it is the working class and people that are involved there that make it turn, of course. Um, but I, I think that for a country as big as ours, again, I, I worry a lot about scaling. A country as big as ours, we can't be 
in these factions. We can't be splintered off. We need something that makes us cohesive in many ways. Um, and, and especially for our economy. So the fact that, you know, we have a quasi or I guess a, a, a central bank in the, in the Federal Reserve, essential. All these departments for public education, public housing, 100% agree. I think some of these problems become, though, um, we can't get everybody. So one of the problems of a kind of melting pot, I guess people don't use that word anymore, but a very multicultural kind of society in a democracy, quote, quote unquote, in a democracy is you're getting a lot of opinions and mm -hmm. it just becomes very slow to do things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that where you respect other people's ideas and their opinions? So I can have my personal ideas, mm -hmm. but I don't want to impose mm -hmm. because that kind of goes against the whole liberal pluralism idea. I can't impose that on somebody. And to also because of, I think, I think in things like geographic locations. I can't say what works for me is going to work for people in Idaho. It's completely different. It's a different history, a different terrain. It's a massive country. It's a lot of different people, different immigration waves, et cetera. I cannot impose a, well, you know, uh, we had a $6 trillion bill. And if you just would have just got your senators in line, then we would have had it. It would have been great for everybody. Maybe I would have been fine with that, but I have to say, well, what happens when other people and enough people aren't fine with that, right? Nah, I think that's where you can kind of have some of the ideas of, well, whoever's in charge, they get, they get their four years to do it or they get their eight years to do it. If you don't like it, we fix it next time. Like, and that kind of does more or less happen. Um, but again, I, I think that it's one of those things where people, it's, it's, it's like sitting with, it's like my personal stuff. But then I, I have like this other side of my brain that's like, but what about the, you know, 329 million, blah, 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 other people that maybe don't think that way or they do some variant of it. I wouldn't want to be so, you know, uh, uh, overbearing to say, well, we got to do it this way because I know it's, I know it's good for you. I know it's right for you. But maybe, maybe it is. But I, I think it's how do I have respect for people that say, you know, and I think you can have some of those debates with certain policy issues, other things, um, maybe less so. I guess the, the, the question I, I, I do want to ask is, you mentioned it before, is about this good enough universalism, which I'm very curious for you to, for you to, uh, to explain on this. So, you know, how, what do you mean by this? I think this is in terms of a, a kind of against a relativist argument. Um, how, how, do you, how do you see this and how does it push for a person to be successful and autonomous? Yeah, I mean, so I think um, it's, you know, these are really interesting problems and concerns, right? And, and I think the kinds of practical issues you're getting at are, are really important. And I, you know, I wish I had like, obviously, if anyone had like the perfect answer that we could have said. <laughs> right. Probably we would have You don't want to impose on other people, but you also don't want to be imposed on, right? Like I, I don't. If the solution doesn't work for someone in a particular place, then, but it does work for me. Like how can I, how mm -hmm. can I make sure that this this works out in some meaningful way? That's not just you know me sort of deferring, but also is in you, right? And, and what does that look like? And in theory, that's compromise. And in theory, in a functioning society, right, you manage to make those compromises because you trust. The, you know, it's not that I think. You know, my my concern is that like. Um, we're not really talking about what's good for the farmer in Idaho. What we're talking about is, is what's good for the giant corporation that owns a thousand farms in Idaho mm -hmm. and, you know, is giving all the money to the, to the people making these kinds of decisions. Like that, that's more my kind of concern and, and where mm -hmm. I sort of worry about some of the, the inequality issues and the kind of power mm -hmm. imbalances um, is that actually probably the, you know, the farmer, and I don't know, we might disagree about some things, right? But at the end of the day, I think, and this is maybe a kind of good enough universalism, right? It's like they, he, he she, they, and I, right? We, we both kind of want a world in which we feel loved, cared for, respected, appreciated. We're able to kind of pursue our sense of the good and we're able to live a, a decent life, regardless of whether or not we are like perfect or the best or, or whatever. And so, again, th this is why I think the idea of a good enough, a good enough universalism is that. It's not going to be a perfect, you know, right? right? Mm -hmm. We can't kind of erase human difference. I don't think we should. It's probably true that, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter to me that much how much money I have. And, and I'm not that good or interested in, in financial matters, whereas somebody else might be. And so 
that person who decides, okay, I'm going to take my time and I'm going to kind of use it in these investment ways, they might wind up right with more money at the end of the day than I do. But I, I do, I don't think they should have really that much more than it, than anybody else. Or someone else might sort of decide, you know, I don't want to work that much because family is really what's important to me, mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to spend more of my time kind of caring and, and taking, you know, supporting people, um, which is something also right that the society requires and, and needs is aged care is child care like these kinds of things that are not monetizable or when they are monetized generally degrading quality kind of rapidly and horrifyingly um so so these are the 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 the, the kinds of things that i that i that i worry about when we sort of say um when we say, okay, yeah, like if this person makes tons of money, it's fine because that may, the, the money aspect of it may not kind of hit all the things that we need as a, as a social order. So I've kind of wandered a bit from the good enough universalism question, sorry, but, but just to kind of keep talking through some of the No, no but, 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 but that's the thing. I mean, I, I fully agree with you. You and I, the, the amount of difference we have or disagreement is, is like this small, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm with you on everything and I agree my things maybe it's a point of emphasis on, on where we're mm -hmm. shining the light i guess on things which is how do we do this at scale how do we respect other people's maybe you know opposition of these things and 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 then and then how for people that do have some opposing viewpoints why and how can they see the bigger picture because i think with the universalism piece is sure this can be good for some people, this can be good for some people, mm -hmm. whatever. But if we're promoting a society where you have to have greatness or perfection, I, I think that in itself is maybe not a bad thing. But if it's at the expense of other people around you, well, mm -hmm. then that's not going to be beneficial for you or anyone else in the long run. Mm -hmm. that's, a hard, that's a hard boulder to push up the mountain for a lot of people because of you know, temperament, personality, experiences, et cetera. And that's where I think this stuff kind of gets, uh, I guess, hamstrung a little bit is you, you and I might agree on a lot of this and maybe other people do, but then it's, well, cool. But how do we, how do we talk to the people that maybe don't agree about this? Right. And so, um, I, I guess one, one other bit about that is, which is a little, it's in the same world, but a little bit different is you mentioned it earlier about people are burnout and stuff. And, and I, I did want to ask you this is how do we, how do we, and again, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not an anti-capitalist, right? I like capitalism, uh, with regulation, checks and balances and in moderation <laughs> and I hate crony capitalism, right? I think it's mm -hmm. awful, mm -hmm. but there is this absolute, uh, I, I don't know, persuasion that people have, especially in the United States. Okay, I'll say it this way, right? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sort of kind of formulating my thoughts, sorry. Yeah, Which is, I see this all the time. I, I hear about this in, 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 in my professional life, in my personal life, where people are absolutely, I don't want to be too dramatic, but you know, enslaved or indentured to work. and. And I think, I think it's this idea that work gives them value. It gives them meaning. And it's because it's either an avoidance of dealing with themselves and many of mm -hmm. their hard things in life. Mm -hmm. um, or it's a way of, well, this is the only thing I do know. And so this gives me value. And, and I can't tell you how many people I talk to where work is all there, you know, and you can see this on both ends. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you have the conservative that wants to just buy their bootstraps, work really hard, go up the ladder, make a bunch of money, blah, 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 blah. They're very motiva uh, motivated, incentivized with this and, and, and have less concern for um, kind of the gestalt of things, whether it's with other people, other people in society, maybe people in their own life. And then on the other side, you have people maybe on the more liberal sides of things where they have this, you know, wearing their heart on their sleeve, bleeding heart. They need to work at a job that is like making change in the world and doing all these things, which is admirable. I can understand that, but I don't need you. I don't think your fucking job needs to do that. You can do that on your own time. But if that's because then their job 
they're going to work 80, 90 hours a week because they're saving the turtles or they're doing a shoreline cleanup and like, I'm needed. I need to do this and I'm going to work 90 hours. And if it's not right, that's another turtle that's going to die. Oh my gosh. And it's this whole I think quasi narcissism of sorts, but, but I don't think it's intentional, but it's, it's so you have on, on different angles here where work is how someone identifies and or they will use it as a replacement to avoid many things about their life. And so how, how, so I, I say all that because how do you promote a, and, and, and there's many jobs that are pushing for, you know, working more and more and more and more and more. Like you can't get a break. You can't do this. And if you do, you should feel guilty or maybe your job's at risk. I hear this all the time. How, how do you, how do you have a, a, a social change, an economic change, a financial change, a, a, a cultural change where we view work differently, where that's not the case, where maybe, maybe work and what you do at work and what you're doing is good enough. And that's all it needs to be. It just needs to be uh, good enough. It doesn't need to be, you know, the best or all these incentives or the highest productivity rates or um, the most billable hours or whatever you want to say. How do we have it where uh, people can work and it's and it's not their sense of identity and and they're you know good enough? Okay, and I think I think you know you. One of the interesting things. For me, at least, kind of going back to what you were you were saying earlier too, is just that I do think there are a lot of the problems where we can't talk to each other or manage to kind of find common ground are related to this kind of fracturing in in our social world. And I I do hope I mean some of the idea here is that kind of making a world in which right what you do, the kind of work that you do, um, how much money you make, isn't so fundamental to your identity. Mm -hmm. could open up a space in which people who right now feel like they're constantly in competition with each other, right? For access to money, to housing, to prestige, to power, um, might not have to look at themselves that way. I'm not saying, again, it's going to be utopian or perfect, and they're still going to be pissed at each other because someone's going to you know, <laughs> sleep sure. with someone else's partner or whatever, right. um, and people are going to be rude, and like that's, that's all there. But maybe we can reduce somewhat the, the degree to which um, this competitive feeling pits us against you. I mean, you know, this is the way we design a society. We are pitted against each other. And, and then we kind of turn around and we say, well, why is everyone so unhappy and so mad at each other? And it's like, well, <laughs> we just, that's the system we made. We designed it that way. Um, and we could say we didn't fully design it, right? I mean, things are complicated and they have mm -hmm. non-human causes. But in any case, um, in terms of the, you know, so that's the beginning of an answer also to this, this work question, which is that, you know, if, if it is really meaningful for you, right, you are a, a podcaster um, or you're a public school teacher or you're a writer or you're a basketball player or, you know, you're someone who, who stocks shelves and really cares about their order and their appearance and, and what they look like for people because, you know, you're paid well and you find your job meaningful and, and this kind of aesthetic matters to you, um, then by all means, right, do do a lot of that. Like, I, I can't, I have no interest in... in um, stopping people from, from, you know, doing the things that they love and care about. But if it's that, right, the way that you're spending your life now is so wrapped up in work because our society is so wrapped up in the economy, um, then, you know, you feel like you have to do all of this all the time, right, just to kind of make ends meet. That's the kind of thing where I would sort of say we have, you know, again, I understand that there are complicated economic models and economists, I think, think I'm just kind of a fool but I'm interested in the normative principles that guide our economics. And I think a lot of those normative principles um, are not about how can we make sure that everyone is involved and in working less, right? They're about how do we grow the economy most and the fastest to create the maximal kind of innovation and, and, and growth. And so those are very different questions. And if we're asking the other question, it's kind of hard to see how we don't wind up in a work-obsessed society because we're a growth-obsessed society. Um, if our society is sort of, well, how do we make sure that everyone, no matter what, is involved in some way, doing something, and maybe you know, working a bit less because more people are doing things, we might be able to, to diminish the place of work in our lives, except when, again, like the thing you do is, is the thing you, you know, where you're, when, when you're able, and I think it's a really fortunate thing, you know, when your passion and your 
your labor kind of aligned can be a really beautiful thing and you can yeah. pursue that. But it's also true, and I, you know, I talk a little bit about this in the book, that there are people who really, as you were mentioning, want to save the world. And so, right, if, if that's your goal, you know, and, and for good reasons, right, people are dying and, and, and the planet is burning and there's lots to be, to be worried about. Um, then, of course, right, you're going to kind of work all the time. But, you know, we never really talked about the, the kind of origin of good enough. And, and for me, these are very linked things because the, the phrase itself I take from Donald Winnicott, who's a psychoanalyst, and to just kind of give, you know, the quick version of his theory, he talks about the good enough mother, good enough parent. And he basically says, you know, what, what we want is to be this great parent, right, who gives everything to our kids and, and you know, make sure they're, like, never crying, never sad, so on. So, you know, mm-hmm. just, you want your kids to feel loved. And he says, you know, that's all nice, but what you're doing in the process is you're burning yourself out because you're doing too much, and you're not really helping your child because they're not learning how to adapt to failure and difficulty and growing their capacities for, for creativity and wonder and change and transformation and so forth. And so... You know, I think you can apply that to some of the things that we do when we enter these kinds of workspaces, which is, you know, if you're burning yourself out and you're not. Not able to do roles or be part of the organization or, you know, you're, you're kind of you've got like 80 hours of work a week and you have this intern and all this intern wants to do is do work, but you're going to say like, I need to make photocopies, right? Because too much is on your shoulders. You know, you become this kind of great parent and you're not being a good enough parent. You're not being a kind of good enough member of a community. And people like, I I cite Adrienne Marie Brown in the book because she talks a little bit about this and and her kind of model of trying to move from being a burned out activist um, to someone who really thinks about herself as part of a community of people and each one has to put in their work and, and do their work, but that you can kind of share and, and stagger as she, she says. Um, so there, there are various, various ways to, to think about what this, this kind of other order would look like. But again, it's not to solve the problem. Like, it's not like, you know, we're going <clears> to <throat> be in a society where machines are, you know, or 40, I used to say, right. The sharks are going to bring us breakfast or whatever. Like it's not some kind of perfect, we don't have to do anything anymore. Um, we still have work to do and some of it's going to be kind of annoying, but maybe, right. Someone like me, if we had a kind of national service system or something where like, okay, there's some kind of crappy work that has to be done. Everyone do a couple of years of it, right. Everyone kind of be part of the community, work together. Um, we've got to kind of dig these trenches or we've got to build these panels or whatever it might be. I don't know if national service is the right model, but you know, something where we're all doing some of the, the shitty jobs. Um, that have to be done, but they're evenly distributed. Right? All of us are kind of doing some of them. Then maybe, right, it frees us up later on to find the things we care about, are passionate about. Um, <clears throat> that's not a very well, I probably shouldn't even say these things out loud. This is like my kind of half-baked idea, but I, I, there's something I like. About yeah, no, no I, I do. I do. There's, I, I see a lot in that as well. I, this is a question I've had about... Um, <sighs> I, I want to ask you about virtue ethics, but before I get to that, I want to ask you about something more, which I think is somewhat connected here. So, <clears throat> oh boy, <laughs> oh, I haven't I haven't tried this idea out publicly. So let's let's see if uh, if, if people uh, if people start uh, un- unfollowing me now. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I want to say at the outset, I know how it sounds, right? Okay. And it's a product of me getting older. Um, I have some concerns, not I'm losing sleep over it or whatever, but that the, the very new generation, people 25 and under, you know, 25 to call it 15, There's not a lot of incentives and or seemingly desire or passion as in previous generations to do certain types of work or work in general. So what you'll see a lot of the times or what I've seen is, you know, kids will, you'll ask adolescents or kids in high school or, you know, whatever and say, well, what do you want to do when you're, when you're out of high school? Mm. Blank. I have zero idea, no idea, you know, and, and I, look, college is not for everyone. There's many issues with the, with the university system at the moment. It's terribly expensive. There's a lot of debts. There's like, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of issues with higher education, mm-hmm. a lot of issues, issues I've talked about on this podcast previously, <clears throat> no question. Uh, 
And I'm not one of those people that think everyone needs to go and, and get a degree and get a doctorate. And, no, don't, don't think that either, right? I think people should be able to if they want to, and, and it should be affordable, but that's a different problem. That's a different question. Should I get quality education? That's a different problem, different question. But I, I don't think everyone's cut out for it. And that's, that's totally fine, right? That's totally fine. But I, I, I see a lot of young people where it's, it's seeming like it's just blank. They have no concept. Okay, the counter would be, well, who knows what they want to do with the rest of their lives when they're 17, 18 years old. Totally fair as well. I'm not saying that either. But I guess that there's a, there's a, there's a kind of malaise about, well, I don't know. I'll live with my parents or I'll, I'll just make TikTok videos. And that can be quite lucrative. I'm not, I'm not you know, demeaning that. Um, I'll get on OnlyFans. I'll be a YouTuber. I'll you know, have a Discord, you know, a Twitch stream. All of these, these, these things. And maybe that's fine for a little bit or, or maybe that's fine for, for a time or to get you going if you can really game it and make some money off of it. But do you want to be, you know, making YouTube videos when you're 28 years old and you've been doing that for 10 years and like, you know, where is that pushing you? Right. And, and maybe I am, you know, I'm the boomer in the room. Right. And I sound like these kids these days, they need to, maybe that's how I sound. But, and the other way, right. You have certain folks, you know, generations of people where they're overworked, they're working too many hours. It's their whole identity. And then you have another generation that is kind of blank on what they want to do and kind of settling for, well, just, you know, whatever, I'll just make it happen. Not, doesn't seem to be a lot of drive. And again, I, I'm not, I'm not saying this is everyone. I'm not saying this is the average. I'm not saying any of that, but there's a handful of, of young folks that I personally have talked to and I've seen other people where that's, it's not as there as much. And, and I, I wonder for folks that are in that kind of category, what do we how, how does how does a good enough life model work for them? Where it's like, well, I just need it to be all right. You just need it to just be good enough for you if they're already kind of in that space. And I'm not saying they need to pull all of it from work, but, you know, in general, how, how, how would you think about that or, uh, mm -hmm. of sorts? It's interesting. And it's, it's um, you know, I'm, I mostly meet college students when I'm, you know, either like friends, kids. Um, or, or, you know, college students. So I don't, I don't have a good demographic example, and I can't really speak to the, the phenomenon. I mean, as you're describing it, my, um, I wouldn't say defense, but my, you know, kind of my, my sense of an explanation is that I can imagine being an adolescent right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you are paying attention, right, kind of seeing that there are TikTok stars and there are people who are not, like there's this kind of world that's really split into, again, like kind of this winner-loser system. Mm -hmm. um, where some people are making, you know, you know, attention on the internet is a lot reflective of an economy, right? It is not evenly mm -hmm. divided. There are some people, as right, you probably know much better than I do, right? Like some podcasters who probably aren't any more, you know, talented or interesting than you get a lot more attention. Um, and we could talk about the way that that works and so on and so forth. But, you know, if, you, if you're living in, in, that, in that world and you're seeing that, right, some of them are going to say, well, I'm going to try to be the one who's everyone going to listen to. Um, and a lot of them are going to say, you know, I, I, the, the world, the world that I'm looking at is a precarious, um, weird existence where I'm never going to be able to afford a home. I can't afford to go to college. Mm -hmm. um, I'm basically going to live with my parents and mm -hmm. um, do what I can and, and get by. And I don't know that that is an irrational response to what strikes me as a kind of irrational set of possibilities sure. presented yes. to them of like winner, you know. Right, right. Um, and so, you know, the students that I tend to, to meet, I mean, just for the last few years, I think it's, I taught at Rutgers for a while, and I, I think it was State University in New Jersey, and you meet a very different group of students there um, who I think are often, um, you know, the kind of brightest in, in their class, but not kind of uh, from wealthy backgrounds or incredibly ambitious often. Mm -hmm. So they're, mm -hmm. they are interesting people and i think for them there is still kind of a good enough model that i have in my mind you know they want to kind of live decent lives i, you know, I teach literature classes so many people who want to write or um produce music or, or make kind of tv shows with their friends you know kind of interesting group of, of students and I, I don't know what they're up to now um, but you know when, when i taught at princeton for four years you know it's like you, you just 
everybody, I mean, not everybody, I had a student who wants to be a librarian last semester, but he was like the first one that I met when I was like, met a student at Princeton who was like, you know, I just, I kind of want to make like $60,000, $70,000 a year and like have a little house and help kids find amazing books that'll change their lives. I was just like, how come, how, you like literally, I taught hundreds of students, all of them kind of fantastically interesting, ambitious people, but this wasn't in there frame. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's that. I don't think it's like there's something wrong with the generation, right? I think they're looking at a world. Mm -hmm. And again, they're kind of seeing, well, if I'm only, you know, I, I did, I asked my students last, as I was, I was leaving Princeton last semester, and I thought, okay, I'm going to do an experiment. Um, in the fifties, I know in, in England, they did this uh, survey of high school, public, um, sorry, not public, private, I mean, it's confusing in the UK, but you know, the equivalent of public school here, students. Um, and they said, you know, would you rather have like a not very well paying, interesting work or a very well paying, uh, not very interesting and maybe unethical labor? And the vast majority of those students said interesting work uh, for not that much money. And they were, you know, this is the 50s in English, which means this is the beginning of a social democratic state that is guaranteeing <laughs> some kind of basic means of subsistence. I asked my, I'm not scientific at all, but I asked my 24 students, two of them, the librarian and the other one, I'm not sure what she wanted to be. Two of them said they would um, have a not very well-paying, interesting job. And 22 of them said, I want to make, and, and the reason they gave, I sort of said, guys, like, is this really the vision of the society they have? They said, no, no, no. But, you know, this is the world we live in. And they said to me, you know, I can't imagine making that much money. And yeah, my job might not be interesting, but my life would be interesting, right? Like if I'm making a million dollars a year, I could do all sorts of crazy things. And, you know, and so the ways in which, again, they're looking at that world and they're responding to it. Um, so that, that I, don't, I don't know if that, that fully answers your question. In terms of the kind of what, what is my good enough philosophy I mean? Ideally, <laughs> you know, I don't know, but ideally, right, it would be sort of saying a lot of what I try and write about in the book is like, what we're talking about is promoting and participating a good enough life for all. Mm -hmm. And so I'd love for these students to think not like, well, I'm just going to be either precarious or fabulously wealthy or like a TikTok star or nobody. Right. But like I can be, I can try and connect with others and try and make a world that because it works for everyone, I am part of that. Everyone, right. I am going to, it's going to kind of function well and be meaningful for me. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and I'll just clarify, you know, I, I, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with any generation and, and certainly not the, the mm. younger generation. I mean, there's so much. Oh, my goodness. I mean, this generation more than the, than the previous one and the one before that has so much potential for so many things because of technology and innovation and all these things and how far we've come. Man, there's so much stuff. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of, you know, young people that are really interested and involved in doing that, which is wonderful. Um, and so, you know, that's going to be super exciting to, to see and to watch. Yeah. Um, but I, I only mentioned, you know, I've come across this kind of, you know, mild phenomena. Um, yeah. and I've heard other people say this as well of, of, but yeah, there's a subset where it is, mm, I think I think what you're saying is right. There's there's not a lot of options in the in the reality of the world we live in, and it becomes that whole, you know, what, what do I do? Like you know, I mean, it's not the you get the good government job and you stay there and get your pension and you know like it was in the '70s or whatever it was, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's no. I, I'm not going to go to school for ten to fifteen years to be a lawyer or a doctor or, you know, whatever. Um, that's not kind of on the on the books. You know, and, and so there's these ways, these, you know, people are resourceful. They're like, well, I can find what's out there and I can make some money off of it and that will get me going and that's enough. And so I, I wonder if it's, well, how do we, how do we, how do we, how do we push uh, where everyone can say there's so many opportunities, mm. where can they have more um abilities to access those opportunities and to use it and then i think kind of the other aspect of this is how do they how, how do how does everybody have a type of of uh, virtues or, or virtue ethics is what you talk about in the book for you know a good enough life so how, how do you see you know virtue ethics kind of coming into play uh, mm -hmm. here so then this actually there's a question i want to ask you based on um, yeah, yeah, yeah. you were just saying but i'll, I'll tie this kind of back in, I think, but 
you know, what, um, so one of the things, you know, the virtue ethicists, uh, of Stan McIntyre and Michael Walzer and Michael Sandel, among others who looked at a society that was increasingly being kind of governed by economic rationality. And, and what that means is, right, we were deciding what should I do? kind of career should I have or who should I marry or, you know, um, which social circle should I be a part of? And like wealth was a determining factor, right? Like the virtue of the people you were spending time with or you know, the quality of their character, or the meaningfulness of the labor was increasingly less and less a part of this. And they looked back um, to thinkers, including Aristotle, including Blaise Pascal, who had said things along the lines of, you know, what creates a meaningful society is a kind of separation between spheres. Michael Walter's term is these kind of spheres of justice. And the idea was, was I think, makes a lot of sense, right? Is it the case that um, education should be about teaching you to make money? If that's, you know, we could, we could debate what the purpose of an education is, right? Is it to be a good citizen? Is it bad practical skills? Mm -hmm. Is it to kind of be wisdom? All of those things are tied up with education and then its possibilities. Is it to make you a lot of money is a reasonable question, but it is a collapsing of the spheres, right? It's one in which the, the sphere of the economy is kind of overtaking the sphere of an educational purpose. And so um, people like, you know, Walter and so forth were sort of saying, what we need to do is just keep these separations between the spheres. And if we do that, the economy can kind of do its thing and it can grow, but also intellectual life can grow on its own terms um, and so on and so forth. Where I have in the book a, a kind of slight disagreement with the virtue ethicists is not on this basic idea, which was, you know, let's kind of figure out how we can be virtuous in these various practices in our life, but that there is still a kind of aristocracy within this, right? So that for Walzer, as for Aristotle, um, there are people who can be the best at ethics, right? It's, and then there are people who can be the best at governing. And the, the argument that they make, and this will kind of, I think, tie into the, the question I'm curious about, is... Um, you know, we should design a society such that we find, right, the people who uh, can do the best governing. And if we find them and we make them our leaders, like, things are going to be good. And, you know, that makes a fair amount of sense. And, you know, Walter will sort of say, well, we can have inequality within these different spheres. That's okay, because it's based on this kind of, you know, ability of having this excellence of this virtue. But there's a lot of questions, and, you know, it takes a while to explain, but kind of what exactly makes somebody the best within any one of these given spheres, right? How do we kind of figure out who the best politician is, especially with a bunch of eight-year-olds, right? Like, who do we kind of train to be uh, the best politician based on, like, what they do in a playground? Like, there may be the best, wisest thinker there might be the most introverted, right? And so we're never going to see that kind of capacity or something like this. And so... My, my concern isn't so much that we, you know, I think the Spears argument makes some sense. Um, I have some, some doubts about, you know, kind of what we talked about earlier with LeBron James. Like, I do think it's about the kind of interrelation of these different practices and spheres and how they support each other. But um, I, I, I worry about this kind of argument where we can, you know, just try and find the best ones because I think it still drives all this competition, all this stress, all this anxiety, all this kind of winner loser mentality just in these kind of different spheres. And they wind up relating back to each other, right? So the, the, best uh, academic, right, makes a ton of money. You know, like the most famous English professors in the world get paid hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And there's tons of people who are adjuncts who get paid a few thousand. And the argument, though, is, well, those people are so much better at what they do. And this is kind of what I was curious about, because I saw you kind of nodding back to my, I'm sure there are other podcasters. I don't It's not about like naming names, but I'm sure the other podcasters who have like huge audiences. Do you think that the people who have the biggest audiences are the best at what they do? And like, what would be the, the means by which we could determine that? And if we can't, right, how do we think about a world in which um, we distribute esteem and attention and reward if it's not exactly possible to say, well, like, you know, um, Xavier has 4,000 followers and um, he, that puts him number 232 on the books podcast list. And that is exactly where he is. He is the 230, you know, like how, how what would that, how would mm -hmm. we go about that? Well, the answer I'm supposed to say is, uh, of course. I mean, no, I mean, there's not better people than me. Of course, mine's the best. I'm supposed to say, right? It has a promotion and all these things, right? Of course, I'm supposed to say that. Um, it's completely untrue. There's so many better podcasters than me. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so <laughs> it's a it's a complicated labyrinth. So. <sighs> I always remember 
what Heidegger used to say about the, the subjective is always subsumed within the objective in the backdrop of the phenomenology. So there's this, there's this idea that it is two things, right? It depends on person's subjective interest, right? You know, people listen to my podcast for whatever reason they listen to. They love three hour conversations. Um, I'm always blown away by that. I'll upload a very long conversation. I'll be like, no one's going to listen to this three hours. No one's going to listen to it. That always gets the most downloads. I think, I don't know if people are just one curious about like, God, how long could you talk about this subject or, Oh, your poor <laughs> guest or, Oh my God, do you get tired at a certain point? Or if they're really just interested in, you know, I have no idea. I have no idea. Mm. Um, but you know, I think that there's, there's something out there for everybody. And I think when someone can transcend the ability to be, um, I don't want to say applicable, but they can, they can really connect with other people of varying different categories and interests and whatever. I think there's, that's a, a skill that is something that is, uh, appealing for people. Then you have people that will do just the one thing, but they do it really well. They just do it. You know, that's it. You know, one topic or one or two topics or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, the people that have the biggest, you know, platforms or whatever. I mean, a lot of this stuff is just exposure. You know, they've written a book or a few books. They've already, they're already a popular name. So they have an audience mm -hmm. where people are going to come to them and listen to them. And maybe they're not great. Um, but they already have a following of sorts. So it's a little bit about that. You know, sometimes it can be about, it's not just the content, but it's also how you're, you're, you're going about things. Um, I remember when I first started, I, I don't get it as much anymore, but people used to say, you know, make these comments about as the weirdest compliment I ever got. It's still very strange. I get it every now and then, but that I have a really nice voice. Um, mm. And, you know, you don't know your own voice. You don't think about it that way. <laughs> it was really strange when, when my mother told me that she's like, you know, you have a really nice voice. I was like, mm. I mean, you birthed me. How is that? How is this the first time you're telling me this is a strange thing? So I never thought about it till now. But that's a weird thing. Like, I don't know. I, I can't control that. And like, that's not something that I, when I thought about doing, doing the podcast, I thought, well, you know, I have a really nice voice. So I never even clicked for me. Right. I don't think about it too much. So, uh, you know, I think, but then there's an objective thing, right? If you put with your peers side to side, you know, what kinds of questions do they ask? How are they good conversationalists? How are they keep, you know, engaging with the person? Um, you know, do they, do they, do they ask good things that kind of get into some kind of, you know, dicey territory, but they handle it well? Are they giving something that's not the same as what everybody else does, but it's something different? You could find a million criteria for, for what, what do people look like that make it the best. Um, but I think it depends on what people want. And I don't think if, if, if 200 people want this, that makes it good. That just makes it popular. And I don't see those things as equal, right? Um, so, you know, I mean, I think that it really just does depend. I mean, I, I talked to some fellow podcasters and you know, sometimes we'll share notes or, you know, ask for advice and stuff. And, you know, they'll tell me and I'll tell them, look, this is your thing. This is your style. Keep doing it that way. Don't change it, you know, because of, you saw this or that or, you know, and people have told me that like, no, 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 you're good. Keep doing Nobody's doing what you're doing in the same way you're doing it, you know, and okay. So I think when you scale this with kind of functions in society, you know, I'm, I'm not, um, I, I'm not uh, uh, opposed to a type of arist uh, aristocracy. I think there's a lot of ver uh, merits and value in it. Um, you know, the objective criteria, the rational criteria for that, you know, I think you could probably develop something that people would mostly be like, okay, as a, as a process, that's probably decent enough. Um, and I think that there's elements of that that are correct, right? You know, I mean, I'm... <laughs> in theory, I mean, this is a terrible example, but in theory, you want 
you know, the president or the leader or whatever to be competent, knowledgeable, uh, et cetera. And that's ideally what you want it to be. Does that happen? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Most of the times not. Um, you know, but I, I mean, I think that there's some way that, and, and I do think when you're, when you're talking about governing or um, how, how, how is there some type of way of organizing big, big uh, groups or divisions or departments or whatever? You need people that are, are well-versed and know what they're doing. We, we, we kind of expect that, I think, because of that responsibility. I don't think that's the same way with quote unquote intellectual thought leaders in society. Mm -hmm. I actually think that's the opposite. We don't need to be looking up to people to kind of tell us the wisdom from on high and then we parrot it or we have cult followings of that. I think each person needs to find their own voice and their own way of doing that. You can be influenced and inspired by people that are, have good ideas, but I don't think it should be this kind of following of sorts. So, you know, I think it, I, I think it depends. I mean, I, there's an objective stance. There's a subjective stance. I think both are needed. Um, and I, and I, and I think it is, is difficult. I, I think in some domains you want to kind of, uh, more sanitized, you know, aristocracy of sorts. Um, but I think in other domains you probably wouldn't, wouldn't want that. So I think it, it kind of depends. I, I don't know. What do you yeah. think? No, no, it's interesting. And I, I appreciate how you answer that because I think one of the, one of the places that uh, I don't want this argument to go is like against talent or expertise. Like it's not really saying, well, just, you know, any, give anyone a microphone and anyone can do this, right? Like you study the craft, you learn what you're doing, you think about it seriously. You might find that, you know, I don't think I would be like a great, I don't, I don't have the energy that you have to do these kind of conversations. Like, you know, there are those kind of elements of, of aptitude <laughs> sure, that, you know, that sure. really matter. Um, and I think that that's really important. But I also think what you said, you know, what I'm interested in is that kind of balance between like the talent that clearly exists and that, you know, some people might have a little more over, some people might have had more opportunities to cultivate for various reasons. Or, you know, some people I think are also, there's always the late bloomer problem. Like, you know, maybe some of the kind of top podcasters now from the very beginning of their lives knew that they wanted to like be on radio or like engage in intellectual discussions. And so they have been like, like Tiger Woods, right? They've been developing this skill for so long. But you might have other people who kind of, you know, I don't know, like I'm a bit of a kind of jack of all trade. Like I kind of will look into one field for a while and I'll look into another one. And, you know, I kind of get lost in things. And I think that's some of what makes me kind of interesting, but it also doesn't, I, I don't, do great like when it's like okay you have to meet these certain metrics for this particular field and so i'm interested in, you know how do you develop something that respects the fact that there are going to be different kinds of talents and abilities out there um and we can you know have a system in which people are able to do things that are kind of meaningful and interesting and, and get recognized for that to some extent um well, without right getting rid of this kind of these kind of talent questions, and my my concern is that you know with something like, I mean, this doesn't happen. Our politics isn't really about the best governor, right? And I get I get the virtue ethic, our, uh, ethics argument there because if it were right, we've got very different questions of the people we we elect than than the kinds of ones that we do. Um, but I think that there may be implicitly some sense of that, right? That like. Uh, the person who, you know, and, and it is strange. Someone was saying to me, this to me the other day, right? But, you know, you could become president or not president based on like one state in the country. And then the number of things that follow from Arizona voting one way or Georgia voting or whatever, or Michigan voting one way are enormous, you know, absolutely enormous. And there is something to me, I don't know that this is really the best kind of system for organizing these things, this kind of winner takes all system. And what would something else look like? You know, there are theories out there. There's this book, Open Democracy, that Helen uh, Landemar has written that I think explores some of these ideas people might be interested in. But, um, but yeah, and, and, you know, the, the problem is, I think at some level, like, say you're, you're famous in something else, you develop a podcast, you soak up all this attention and all this space, and there's a lot of kind of interesting things that get lost. And some of that's probably inevitable, right? Um, but I do wonder, uh, I do wonder about how we might limit that or think about 
ways in which that affects us in other realms of our lives. Because at least for me, you know, like you said, coming from the kind of university system, I usually, I, some people look are, are clearly quite brilliant, but you know, whether they're then the best colleagues or the best teachers, um, and how many people who are incredibly smart I know who never found a job or never found their home. Uh, I can't, I, there's no intellectual difference between often people who are very prestigious in the profession and people who no one's ever heard of. And that, that always strikes me as a somewhat, you know, and probably like I said earlier, you know, the sports analogy isn't great to extend out. There are times I worry that I extend out kind of my own experience in university life and seeing that. And then I kind of wonder, you know, is everything kind of like this. Um, and so I try this as some of the, you know, the good enough ideas, like this isn't a, a perfect model is one that I've come to through these kinds of experiences and I'm looking out in, in other spaces. Uh, but no, I, I just, I, I appreciate what you said there, right? That it is, there is like, there are some questions about the ability, but also that's not the end of the story. And, and we know that the ways in which esteem and prestige circulate in society have to do with lots of other things. Yeah, I, I have a, I have a follow up to that. And then I have a, I have two final questions for you. But um, my follow up to that is, is it kind of is this old <clears throat> question of, do you do what you enjoy? Or do you do what you're good at? And if those yeah. aren't commiserate, well, which one do you pick? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I've known a handful of people that they might be good at something, but they just don't, yeah. they don't have the drive. They don't have the passion. They don't, they don't, they don't have the commitment. They don't have the, the, the perseverance. They didn't know not enough interest, but yeah. they're good at it. Yeah. So what do you say with that? Yeah. We'll do it. <laughs> because <laughs> you can do it. You have the skills. I can't, and other people can't. So do it. And you're almost like mm -hmm. beholden to this and you hate it. Mm -hmm. Right? You don't want to do that. The other end, someone's super passionate about something, they love this, but it just doesn't love them back for whatever reason. And they don't have quite enough of the capacity or the competency to quite get to the bare minimum that they need for doing whatever it is. Um you know, I love physics, but I cannot be a theoretical physicist because mm -hmm. I don't have the IQ points. I just can't do it. Right. So, you know, okay. I own that. I, I accept that. You know, that's not the, you can be whatever you want when you grow up. It's like, no, you can't, you can't do that. Right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just don't, there's certain things mm -hmm. that, that, that kind of uh, limit you fine. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that that's where it becomes that question where sometimes I think most people kind of fall somewhere in the middle of the bell curve. They're, well, you know, I'm good at these things or I'm okay at this or this one thing I'm really good at is kind of augmented by the other things that I'm, you know, average at. And I really have a passion for this and I can supplement. There's usually a, some version of that. And <clears throat> I think that's where it's the, it's the human. Right. It's the whole person. It's the whole human, right? That comes out from that and says, Yeah, you could be really good at this, but you know, this person isn't the the most social. They're, they don't know how to work well on a team with people, but my goodness, they're really good at this thing that we need. How do we how do we make these you know? and so I think that that's where it's how do you invest and build into people at, a, at an early age to 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 train them and to to say, here's, here's what you could do. And if they want to, great. If they don't, they don't. Um, I think the German education system has some variant of this. Mm -hmm. um, but <clears throat> you choose earlier. Yeah, yeah which, which I think is at a certain, I think that there's a lot of, I'm very sympathetic to that. I think there's a lot of positives because at the end of the day, it's like, look, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be an electrician. You're just really good at that. You're a good at an electrician. Now, if you don't want to be, that's fine, but you have all yeah. of the skills and tools that you've been trained to do that. And if you want to, and we as a society see that as a respectable life career, and we compensate you well enough to, to live off of that. It has to be all those things that are, yeah. that are in play. And, and in many places it is not that way. So yeah. I think it's, 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 it's a tough, it's a tough thing to kind of, to, to mallet. Yeah, um, no, and I, I mean, I think that's some of the, I appreciate what you're saying, like, it's a bit of what you're good at. And, and I do also want to model, like, I sort of cited the kind of genetic lottery arguments. And I do, like, I get that some of who we are is based on our genetics, but it's not everything, right? And you can mm -hmm. train and you can learn and you can develop. Um, and I think that's also important to, to keep in mind is that I'm sure there are things that I'm good at that I never tried or experienced, you know, and that is just sort of part of a human life. And I, I think that's, you know, you said it very well, that it's something in that, 
in that space between, you know, what you're good at, what you're passionate about, how you bring it all together. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's Paige's argument. I mean, when I, when I talked to her, we, we talked about this and, mm-hmm. and she, she yeah. basically said, you know, she was yeah. just like, you know, that's, it really is an, an interaction model. You cannot ignore the genetic data mm-hmm. about things, right? And even some of her research shows that, you know, extremely high, it was like 100, not even 100%, maybe close to it of, you know, what are the genes for, uh, I think it was executive functioning in certain populations of children or something like that. I don't remember what it was. And even still, yeah. it's the interaction with the environment and yeah. society and yeah. like, yeah. These things aren't in a vacuum, right? And people that, mm-hmm. you know, that people fight about this stuff with various things, but it's, I think most people kind of agree that there's, um, there's the interaction of it, how we then organize our society with that understanding of how humans work. You know, that's what people continue to debate. Right. You, um, you talk about, uh, towards the end, a, a world that is constrained as opposed to unconstrained. Mm-hmm. Can you just briefly mention, you know, what you mean by the constrained versus unconstrained vision of of reality for 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 people? Sure. Yeah. Um, so, and I think this this fits in nicely with what we were talking about, which is this is these are terms from Thomas Sowell, who's so, um, you know identified as a, a conservative um, thinker at the Hoover Institution last I, I checked at Stanford, mm-hmm. and um, you know, Sowell's. If I'm saying that right, actually, I've never heard it said otherwise. But Sowell's argument is, um, you know, that there are, the way that he sees it is there's a kind of uh, left argument that he associates with kind of Rousseau and Marx, especially, that kind of basically sees this unconstrained potential. Humans can become this perfect, harmonious, wonderful thing. He says there's a more conservative strain of thought that works with humans as they are, right? It kind of understands and appreciates where these flawed beings and, um, you know, we, we can't come up with the policy that's going to work the best for everyone. This is a kind of Adam Smith work, this kind mm-hmm. of uh, liberal, liberal conservative, I mean, liberal in the classical sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I wouldn't go too deep into the details of this argument because it's, it's less my concern than, than this kind of, what's interesting for me is I, I agree with the kind of constrained, like constrained vision of things. A good enough model is not a utopian paradise at the end of the day. It is really understanding that there are complexities and problems and things are not going to work our way out of. However, I don't agree with the model of human nature. I don't think that humans just are a particular way and that anything that says like being more sympathetic or being more kind or being more caring grates against this inevitable like dark hierarchical thing in our human nature. And I think the evidence is largely on my side here, both what you were just talking about with uh, Kathy Page Harden, with this kind of model of interaction, right? That, you know, the, the things in our nature actually don't just manifest they interact with our environment and this is the state of <clears throat> cognitive science would similarly say right we are not just a consciousness that then kind of exists in the world but we are embodied we are um I kind of there's four e's I, they're not they're not fresh uh, three hours into the kind of <laughs> embodied extended uh you, you maybe you know embedded i don't know but um in any case there's that model and there's also like from the kind of evolutionary science there is the fact that we don't just have, and this is, you know, Franz Duval that I'm borrowing from, we don't just have a hierarchical past. Uh, we don't just have this kind of chimp top-down model, but as Duval lays it out, we have we have two inner apes, as he calls it, right? One's a kind of from the bonobos, from, with whom we share quite a bit, um, cooperative, maternal, nurturing. And one is this kind of more hierarchical top-down from the kind of chimpanzee. And um, neither of them is exactly entirely one or the other, right? It's not to say that chimps and bonobos are these perfectly determined creatures either. Um, but that we, we, we inherit some of these traits. And in my understanding of things, what Sowell often calls the constrained vision is one that basically says, you know, we have this chimp in us and we have to kind of like deal with our hierarchical domineering nature and, and anything else over constrains that and leads us into these kind of dystopian scenarios. And my argument is it's really a choice. We can choose, you know, we can't get rid of some of our kind of competitive or hierarchical tendencies. I don't, I don't think, I mean, maybe, you know, I don't know, in some future, but for now, um, we have some of that, but it's a question of what do you constrain, right? Are we saying what we should constrain in our society is the cooperative nurturing side of us? I think that's often what we wind up saying these days, whereas I would say what we should try to constrain a little bit more is our domineering, hierarchical, um, 
I'm going to get the best for me and mine, and I'm not going to worry about anybody else. And so the, the argument that I'm making with the constrained vision is like, yes, there are imperfections. Yes, we can't get rid of all this, but don't, don't, I don't want to be told, well, you're constraining some kind of human nature. I want to sort of say, we're all making choices about what we choose to kind of bring out of our plural complex um, ways of being in the world. And there are, you know, I want to advance a different set of choices, um, but I'm not saying that I'm kind of unconstrained. And, you know, yeah, no, I would, I would fully agree. I mean, I think that there's a, a hierarchical model is 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 obviously evident within within uh, the natural world, but I don't think it's only that, and I don't think it's exclusive to that. That's exclusive to us as humans, and um, that we have different modes, if you will, of how to interact, and we obviously have a deeply, deeply uh, cooperative. Uh, uh, sentiment. We have, some people would say, an altruistic and or empathic sentiment. I would say more compassionate. Um, and, and so we have, we're, we're, we're a mixed bag. We have a bunch of different things as humans in terms of <clears throat> what, what we're potential for, barring aside anomalies and stuff. Um, how we find the homeostasis or how we find the balance between those I think is is most instrumental, and that's some of the point of of living a I guess you know say a, a moral life. Well, the uh, the the final question I have for you is um, how do we live a good enough life for flourishing? Right? You've you've written you've written a a a, a fantastic book um, that's you know what, what is it three hundred pages, and you know we've we've talked for three hours. Uh, or close to it um, about all of this. And so how do you think uh, people and, and society can live a good enough life for flourishing? And, and, and how do you want people to best understand what you're saying in the book and, and the argument you're making? Um, so I think the way I lay it out in the book is to kind of think of ourselves within these nest, nesting or these concentric circles, right? We are individuals, we are people who are in relationships, we exist in society, and we exist in our natural environment. And a lot of the kind of, you know, I think people expect when they pick up a book called The Good Enough Life is that it's really going to focus on individually, right? You know, do less, expect less, calm down, relax a little bit. And I have I have some of that that argument here. But what I really wanted was to understand, well, you know, you're trying to live your good enough life, um, be decent, be, be get sufficient, but don't try and take too much. Don't try and overwhelm anybody, you know, don't ask for too much. But what do you do when the world around you is geared in a different way? And I think you can hold on to a lot of these values, but it's something I struggle with. I think it's something that a lot of people struggle with is, you know, on our own, there are limits to what we can accomplish. And this does actually require different kinds of engagements with each other and does require different kinds of social and political models. And it does require thinking about our, our natural world a bit differently. And maybe I'll just close with an example that I use in the book, which is the TV show, The, the Good Place. Mm -hmm. And the, the Good Place, I think, is, you know, without trying to give too much away, it's about the afterlife and it's about a system of judgment in the afterlife. And, you know, you kind of either said you, you did well and you go to the good place or you did poorly and you go to the bad place. And what they realize over the course of the show is that, you know, this is the wrong way to judge humans, right? It's not just that we are good or bad, but it's that we are capable of reform. We are creatures who have the capacity to in, uh, engage with the world around us and learn a little bit better how to be a little more decent every day. But we can't do that if the system that we live in is constantly judging us good or bad and slotting us into a particular place, good place, bad place, and so forth. And so what has to change in the show is not just what these individuals do, but the way that they're judged, the way that they interact with each other, the kinds of rewards and, and meanings and purposes, you know, they have to really overthrow the whole afterlife. So my hope is that without overthrowing, overthrowing the kind of whole system of judgment that exists in a cosmic universe, we can manage in our day to day to make a world that really is decent and sufficient and yet still somewhat imperfect for hmm. Yeah, no, I think, I think, uh, I think that's wonderful. I, I, I mean, I couldn't have said it better myself. The, um, <clears throat> the book is called the good enough life. Um, it's through uh, Princeton University Press. It's a I didn't mention this at the beginning, but it's a gorgeous cover. Um, mm. Yeah, that's really lovely. It's it's a it's a very it's a very very nice cover. Um, yeah. So Carl Spurzen is the designer. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a there's a history behind this bowl. 
um, uh, to some kind of, uh, someone was telling me about this where it's, they kind of work around the cracks and then make it something mm -hmm. out of it and things like that. There's some, some, uh, I think it's from the yeah, East. It could be wrong. A, kintsugi. It's a kind of Japanese pottery where you preserve, you don't, you don't mask over the cracks, but you preserve the cracks. Right. And not only do you preserve them, but you do it with this kind of gold foil. Yeah. Um, so that the cracks actually make it more beautiful. And I think it was very, this was the designer's choice. And I think yeah, it's it's just a nice job. Yeah, yeah. it's great. Um, where can, uh, where can people find you and your work and all the best places to, to get at you? Yeah, pretty easy to find if you just search for Avram Alpert. I have avramalpert.com. I use Twitter very poorly and, um, you know, just sporadically, but I'm, I'm there. And uh, the book is, you know, thankfully pretty widely available, many local bookstores um, and also, you know, the kind of big distributors. So. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's uh, it's fantastic. I highly encourage everyone to to pick it up. Uh, Avram, this is uh, such a, a wonderful time. You've given me uh, almost three hours, and um, I've enjoyed every Thank second you. of it. It's uh, such good conversation. It was, you know, I, I didn't feel the time, and that's always a good mm -hmm. indicator that it's a good conversation. So, I can't say enough thanks for you for 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 uh, for, for coming on and talking to me. No, and thank you so much. You have such kind of rich um, and complex questions. And, and I do appreciate the kind of vibe of the podcast, right? You're coming from different angles, some more agreement, some more disagreement. And I think that helps to develop and fill out the picture and, and advance this kind of dialogue. So thank you for that. No, thank you. I appreciate those words. So thank you. Thank you.